Hello, this is Impact, bringing you all the day's top stories. And later in the programme, more news in depth. I'm Philippa Thomas. President Trump triumphant. He says he's been vindicated after his impeachment acquittal. Democrats say the verdict has no merit. We know we were right, and we know they knew they were wrong, as evidenced by them sort of hiding, shaking in the cloakroom, and even being unwilling to listen. Welcome to the programme. We're live for the next 45 minutes and you can always give me your views at Philippa BBC. To the United States, though, where Donald Trump is feeling confident. He may be only the third US president to be impeached, but as expected, the Republican-dominated Senate did not vote to convict him and expel him from office on those two charges connected to efforts to get Ukraine to investigate a political rival. Here's what Mr. Trump has been tweeting, a mock-up of a Time magazine cover in which he's the president through the years, through the decades, all the way to infinity and beyond. Well, speaking at a rally in Pennsylvania, Mr. Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, was very confident Republicans will be winning in 2020. I really do believe that uh, the Democrats keep trying to run down this president because they know they can't run against this president. I think they tried to impeach this president because they know they can't defeat President Donald Trump in November of 2020. Joy at that acquittal for Republicans, though, was tempered by the fact that the Senate Democrats, who unanimously voted guilty, were joined on one count by a Republican senator and a former presidential candidate himself, Mitt Romney. Here's what he had to say. The grave question the Constitution tasks senators to answer is whether the president committed an act so extreme and egregious that it rises to the level of a high crime and misdemeanor. Yes, he did. The president asked a foreign government to investigate his political rival. The president withheld vital military funds from that government to press it to do so. The president delayed funds for an American ally at war with Russian invaders. The president's purpose was personal and political. Accordingly, the president is guilty of an appalling abuse of public trust. Well, I'm joined now by CBS correspondent Naomi Ruckham, who's in New York for us. Uh, Naomi, what are we expecting from the president today? Well, Philippa, the president will make some kind of public statement at noon Eastern time today from the White House, so just in about four hours here. In a tweet, the president said he plans to discuss his victory on the impeachment hoax. Based on those remarks and the fact that the president's campaign is calling the acquittal vindicating, it's unlikely the president will apologize during his announcement today. Many Republicans still refuse to say that the president did anything wrong. You'll remember back in 1999 when President Bill Clinton was impeached and then acquitted, he did apologize, but Democrats are doubtful that will happen in this case. Philippa? So, Naomi, President Trump feels that he's been vindicated, but we saw something in his State of the Union speech about his awareness that he's got to reach out to more voters. The voters that love him, love him. How mm. does he reach beyond them in election year? Well, Philippa, much of the president's base and supporters never thought he did anything wrong. So the impeachment has not changed their minds. And during his State of the Union address this week, the president again catered to his steadfast supporters by honoring conservative radio host Rush Limbaugh with the Medal of Freedom. But in terms of reaching beyond the base, we are seeing some examples of that. For one, he's asking for bipartisan legislation to lower prescription drug prices. He's also touting the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement signed last Last month, which was also passed with strong support from both sides. But it's unclear right now if the president even believes he needs more than his base in order to win re-election. Philippa? Naomi, thanks very much for getting us up to date from New York. So you can tell attention is very much focused on November and the question of who will challenge Mr. Trump. Democratic rivals for the party's nomination are now campaigning hard in the state of New Hampshire. And we finally have near-complete results from Iowa after the chaos there earlier this week. 
with more than 96% of votes now in from that Midwest beauty contest. Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders has closed the gap with the centrist former mayor, Pete Buttigieg. Both have their first 11 delegates. Third place Senator Elizabeth Warren has five delegates. And the former Vice President, Joe Biden, has none. He is vowing to press on despite what he calls this gut punch from the Iowa vote. Just going to dip now live into something that's happening in Washington, D.C. Uh, Donald Trump is standing up. He's about to deliver uh, an address or a prayer at the well, National Prayer much. Breakfast uh, in I'm Washington. Let's just you, have a quick listen. And sometimes you don't make it easy, and I certainly don't make it easy on you. <laughs> and I will continue that tradition, if I might, this morning. And Arthur, I don't know if I agree with you. But I don't know if Arthur's going to like what I'm going to say. But I love listening to you. It's really great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Congressman, for the great job you've been doing and the relationship and uh, the help. You're a warrior. Thank you very much. And Kevin, you're a warrior. Thank you. The job you've done is incredible. It wasn't supposed to be that way. A lot of extra work unnecessary work. It's wonderful to be with the thousands of religious believers for the 68th annual National Prayer Breakfast. I've been here from the first one where I had the privilege of being asked. I've been with you for a long time before that. And uh, we've made tremendous progress, tremendous progress. You know what we've done. I don't think anybody's done more than all of us together during this last three years. And it's been my honor. But this morning we come together as one nation blessed to live in freedom and grateful to worship in peace. As everybody knows, my family, our great country, and your president have been put through a terrible ordeal by some very dishonest and corrupt people. They have done everything possible to destroy us, and by so doing, very badly hurt our nation. They know what they are doing is wrong, but they put themselves far ahead of our great country. Weeks ago and again yesterday, courageous Republican politicians and leaders had the wisdom, fortitude, and strength to do what everyone knows was right. I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. Nor do I like people who say, I pray for you, when they know that that's not so. So many people have been hurt. And we can't let that go on. And I'll be discussing that a little bit later at the White House. We're joined today by two people whose faith inspires us all. Our amazing, wonderful friend, Vice President Mike Pence, and his wonderful wife, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to all of our great political leaders out there, so many that I've been working with so hard over the last three years, and we've accomplished so much. And to members of my cabinet in attendance, Secretary Mike Pompeo, Mark Esper, David Bernhardt, Gene Scalia, Alex Azar, Ben Carson, Dan Broilett, Betsy DeVos, Robert Wilkie, and Administrator Jovita Carranza. Joining us for this cherished tradition are a lot of friends in the audience. Many really have become uh, friends. They are political leaders. They become great friends. That's all I get to meet anymore. That and the enemies and 
the allies, and we have them all. We have allies, we have enemies. Sometimes the allies are enemies, but we just don't know it. <laughs> but we're changing all that. But thank you all, and thank you all for being here. I also want to welcome foreign dignitaries from more than 140 countries. That's something. That's something. Everyone here today is united by a shared conviction. We know that our nation is stronger, our future is brighter, and our joy is greater when we turn to God and ask Him to shed His grace on our lives. On Tuesday, I addressed Congress on the State of the Union and the great American comeback. And that's what it is. Our country has never done better than it is doing right now. Our economy is the strongest it has ever been. And for those of you that are interested in stocks, it looks like the stock market will be way up again today. According to the latest Gallup poll that just came out a little while ago, a few minutes ago, American satisfaction is at the highest level ever recorded. Can you imagine? And that's from Gallup, no friend of mine. Ninety percent of Americans say they are satisfied with their personal lives. How about that? Isn't that something? Just came out today. They must have known I was going to be here. In everything we do, we are creating a culture that protects freedom and that includes religious freedom. As I said on Tuesday in the House chamber, in America, we don't punish prayer. We don't tear down crosses. We don't ban symbols of faith. We don't muzzle preachers. We don't muzzle pastors. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer. And we raise our sights to the glory of God. Donald Trump there at the National Prayer Breakfast talking about freedom, religious freedom, talking about the great American comeback so that he was heralding in his State of the Union speech and clearly feeling very upbeat. He has survived impeachment. He is confident he can go on to win re-election in November. Now, when we think about the uh, re-election battle, the Democrats have yet to choose their nominee, uh, but the, the rounds of contests have begun. We've heard uh, from Iowa, of course, New Hampshire votes uh, next Tuesday on who they think the Democrats should be. And I'm pleased to say that Trent Spinner, who's a correspondent for Politico, is on the line from New Hampshire. Uh, Trent, impeachment and the acquittal, how is that landing? in the state. That is a huge deal for voters. What I'm hearing from my reporting, and I've talked to hundreds of voters on the ground here, is that they will really hold their nose for any candidate who will beat Trump. Uh, they have a saying, anything but Trump. Uh, they were hoping, Democrats were hoping that he would be impeached. Obviously, that didn't happen. And so they hope to beat him at the ballot box. And so what they're looking for, really, is the most electable Democrat, the person who can take on Trump and beat him in November. OK, so who do you think we should talk about first in that context? Well, I think in New Hampshire, any of the top five could win. I think uh, any of the top eight could could, uh, could come in the uh, could surprise people. Um, so you know, New Hampshire decide New Hampshire voters are really undecided. All the polls show that the majority of people have not made up their minds. Uh, so really, anything can happen here. Well, let's talk about some of the neighbors. I mean, people who would hope to get a bounce from being relatively local include Bernie Sanders, the Vermont senator. Senator Sanders has a behemoth campaign here. He has a ton of money. He has a campaign operation that's about three times the size of all the other front runners. They're out there knocking on doors uh, it, it, to the tune of thousands per day. That's really important here in New Hampshire. It's a small state. People expect to hear directly from candidates. They expect to hear directly from campaigns to be able to ask questions. So if you can get out there with hundreds and thousands of volunteers to knock on doors, sit in people's living rooms and, and explain why you think your candidate is the best, that's really important here. I've also reported from New Hampshire a few cycles ago now, though, Trent. But I remember people talk about momentum and they like to be seen to deliver that momentum. So I do wonder whether Pete Buttigieg will get something more from New Hampshire. 
So that's the story I'm writing today is that Pete Buttigieg really is riding this wave of momentum. What we see in New Hampshire is that everybody has what we like to call a peak, uh, and that's happened. I mean, Senator Booker, uh, 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 people have have had these peaks in the past, uh, and the question is, can you have that peak on election day? Um, Some of the latest polling that came out in the last 24 hours shows that Buttigieg really is surging in terms of the polls. And what's interesting to see is that it's at the expense of former Vice President Joe Biden. So the question is, can he hold on to this momentum for the next week? The other question is, what happens in Iowa? There's a debate on Friday uh, coming up. Um, And so depending on how he does in the debate, that could make a big difference. I think a lot of voters uh, decide following that big uh, final New Hampshire debate. So, yes, he's surging, but he's got a long way to go. And you mentioned Joe Biden there, the former vice president, the uh, veteran insider, if you like. And he's very, very well known to New Hampshire voters. So do you think if he, if he fails to place first or second, do we count him out? So Joe Biden has been campaigning here for the better part of 30 years. People in New Hampshire know him. He's got the highest name recognition. But here's what's interesting. Uh, back last summer, his campaign sort of started to say, look, the early states, we don't need to necessarily win them. They were kind of downplaying the importance of both Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, that has really escalated. In the last several interviews that Joe Biden has done with local news outlets, uh, he has said flatly, no, he does not need to win Iowa. No, he does not need to win New Hampshire. He sees the early primary states, the early voting states, as kind of one big picture uh, throughout the throughout this next month. He sees South Carolina as his firewall, and he thinks that even if he went, loses Iowa, loses New Hampshire, is losing the narrative for a few weeks, but comes out of it with a big victory in South Carolina, he still wins the narrative of the early voting states. And also, don't forget, he has a massive campaign operation in the Super Tuesday states. So they see this as a, as a chance to, uh, to just line up the delegates that they need to win the nomination. Yeah, Trent, explain why Joe Biden would see South Carolina, as you describe it, as his firewall. Is it partly to do with the fact that Iowa and New Hampshire are so very white? You know, I, I, this, this discussion has been going on uh, for months. You know, uh, uh, whether or not Joe Biden has support from white people or, or rural people. And it, it's clear that he does. Uh, but what's really important is that he has the highest amount of support among black people. Uh, Buttigieg, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, have less support than he does. Um, And so, you know, he's really hoping to lean on that to help him win the nomination. And Trent, just a thought about, I think this is your fifth primary that you're you're covering here. Um, Just a thought for our viewers around the world about why there's that special flavor to the early primaries. I mean, you do get to really see candidates up close. You do. I mean, you know, especially in the early on stages of this, I was in a living room with Pete Buttigieg and maybe there were 20 people there and uh, I was three feet away from him. Um, uh, uh, staying on Pete Buttigieg the other day, I was I was uh, in the campaign chase van, the media chase van, and I saw a woman probably f- 10 feet away from him uh, not stand up on a chair and start screaming at him for almost two minutes about some of his policies. and. He was able to, uh, to to listen to her, feel how passionate she felt this was about uh, fossil fuels, and give an answer to her. And that would not be possible in a huge rally in, in an uh, arena somewhere in, in Los Angeles, for example. So New Hampshire voters really take this responsibility seriously. Um, a, a vast majority of the state will vote uh, next Tuesday. And so that level of participation is really important. Trent Spinner, thanks so much. Excellent to speak to you from New Hampshire. We'll keep watching next Tuesday and Wednesday. Thank you. you. Now, in the last hour, we brought you this on impact. President Trump has been speaking for the first time since he was acquitted in his impeachment trial. Addressing the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, he talked about the ordeal that he, his family, and he says the country have been put through. And with the Speaker of the House, the Democrat Nancy Pelosi, in the room, he called his enemies dishonest and corrupt. Here's a little more of what Mr. Trump had to say. As everybody knows, my family, our great country, and your president have been put through a terrible ordeal by some very dishonest and corrupt people. They have done everything possible 
to destroy us and by so doing very badly hurt our nation. They know what they are doing is wrong, but they put themselves far ahead of our great country. Well, President Trump is due to make a formal speech addressing his impeachment acquittal at 1700 GMT and we'll bring that to you live here on BBC World News. A victory for America. Donald Trump's verdict on being acquitted at his Senate impeachment trial. His first response, obviously, a tweet of a video ending with the message, Trump forever. The legal side is over, but not the politics. What next for the Democrats who tried and failed to bring him down? The president gives a televised statement in an hour. In this election year, was impeachment a political gamble too far for the Democrats? Also on Global, a newborn baby contracts the coronavirus just hours after being delivered. The child's mother had tested positive before she gave birth. Can the virus now jump from parent to child? And he was Spartacus. Tributes are paid to the last of the original Hollywood greats, Kirk Douglas, who's died at the age of 103. This is Global. Well, President Trump, you speak in under an hour. Let's go to Gary Donner, who joins us from Washington. It doesn't sound as if he's prepared to move on and forgive. No, I think he's going to... Uh, I mean, I'd be surprised if the tone is very much different from what we heard there at the prayer breakfast. Some of those... Many of those critics were sitting not very far away from him while he was saying all that. Uh, and while it's a sort of, you know, quasi-religious moment in the presidential year, it is also full of the political leaders in Washington sitting there uh, listening to him uh, using it as a political moment as well. So we, we're not sure entirely exactly how this thing will pan out at midday. Probably unscripted, we think, potentially. He possibly may take some questions afterwards. Uh, but you can see from his remarks yesterday that he clearly sees this as a, a victory, not just for him, but for, as he puts it, for the country. Uh, and a, a bit of a springboard, I think, probably for November. Well, yeah, and I don't know if there have been any snap polls, but has this given him, him a, 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 a bump, a bounce? Well, there was a bit of a bounce at the beginning of the week just before the acquittal came out. The sort of the Gallup poll, which is the sort of uh, gold standard in some ways of the on the approval ratings. There are many of them had him at his highest level at 49 percent uh, since uh, well, since he was elected. Uh, it's you know only one poll at this stage. So we'll see where that goes uh, in the coming days. But he will certainly see that and will, will latch has latched onto that as a vindication of his position on Im impeachment. We've we got Nancy Pelosi due to speak in a few minutes' time, I think, uh, a, re a regular press conference uh, by her. Now, of course, she didn't want to go for impeachment, did she, uh, originally? I mean, is there much discussion that this was uh, a political gamble, which has really very badly backfired for the Democrats? Well, well I, I don't think... Well, it may have backfired. She would have been under no illusion that it was likely to fail. Uh, she would have taken that decision in the knowledge that it was likely to fail uh, in, in pure terms of a conviction. And she did take a lot of persuading. It was only really when the centre of her party, uh, particularly a whole group who, of congressmen who used to work in national security roles, CIA, that kind of thing, when they came along and said, look, this Ukraine thing really crosses a huge line, that she was persuaded to do it. There have been people on the left from the beginning of his presidency calling for it. And, you know, the new wave in 2018 were particularly vocal and vociferous in some pretty colourful terms about uh, uh, impeaching the president. But really it was that that movement in the centre that persuaded her to it. Uh, and the jury is still out, don't forget. I mean, uh, they will be, uh, the Democrats will be hoping that those suburban voters, those women, those college-educated women who voted for Donald Trump last time around, who have wavered uh, in the last few years, might be persuaded by some of this, that this isn't a, a fit person to be president, even if he wasn't 
removed from the Oval Office as a result. All right. OK, uh, Gary, for now, thank you very much indeed. We'll have uh, lots more on this story. Uh, in a few minutes' time, I'll be speaking to uh, Mika Mosbacher, who sits on the Trump 2020 campaign advisory board, and also the Democratic strategist uh, Amisha Cross, uh, also to a US pollster, to talk about how this might all impact on uh, the election later this year in November. That's all coming up. Robin Brands, a state straight to Washington. Uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, giving a press conference now. Let's uh, listen in following Donald Trump's acquittal. In fact, we are fighting him in the courts right now to preserve that benefit. That misrepresentation was appalling and so clearly untrue. And next he talked about pre, uh, the, another issue of concern to America's working families, the issue of the cost of prescription drugs. As I've said to you before, I've seen grown men cry across the country when it comes to the fact that they cannot afford the prescription drugs and meet their other obligations to their families. And we had talked about negotiating for lower prices. That's the only way you're going to get lower prices. During the campaign, the president said he was going to negotiate like crazy. I think like crazy means maybe not at all. I've said that to you before uh, because the president's statements have sent pharma socks soaring. And for him to m represent that he was working on that. We had been working on it. We were hopeful to get something done. I guess pharma must have stepped in. And then he talked about saving Medicare, Medicare, Medicare and Social Security uh, when, in fact, in his budget, the 220 budget that he submitted, two, two trillion dollars uh, worth uh, re uh, uh, decreased in Medicare and Medicaid that it combined, including to, uh, in terms of Social Security, uh, reduce the disability benefit in Social Security. So these, you know, one after another, right to the kitchen table of America's working families uh, to serve up uh, these falsehoods. What appalling also was when he was trying to discredit the triumph of the Obama administration on the economy. And I've given you a, 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 a paper on this uh, put out by the Joint Economic Committee under leadership of uh, Don Beyer, our House uh, Vice Chair, on that. And it talks about all the things, job creation and the rest. But to succinctly put it, uh, when President Obama came into office, the unemployment rate was 10 percent. When he left, it was 5 percent. So President Trump did not inherit a mess. He inherited a momentum of job creation. Uh, when President Obama came into office, the stock market was at 6,000. When he left, it was at 18,000. Again, momentum that the administration was able to build on. Not a mess. Uh, uh, the, uh, during the eight years of the Obama, President Obama's presidency, he reduced the deficit by a trillion dollars. Instead, this administration is increasing the trillion dollars. And of course, with their tax cut, their tax scam for 83% of the benefits going to the top 1%, they increased the national debt uh, by two trillion dollars. And therefore, they tried to Pay, it's supposed to pay for itself, but instead they went to Medicare and Medicaid uh, to try to pay for that. But we're not doing that. And then during, um, during the eight years of President, and when President Bush was pr president, the job growth was slow. Under President Obama, we gained more than 14 million private sector jobs. And during his presidency, more than, and, and that is, uh, uh, far more in a prorated in terms of years than what this president has created. A, a momentum, a path of $14 million is not a mess, Mr. President. And then during his presidency, we uh, uh, rescued the auto industry and all that that brought back to the economy. And during the administration, more than 20 million people were afforded quality, affordable health care. But more in addition to that, 150 million families with pre-existing conditions uh, got a new benefit that enabled them to have access to health care as well as uh, other benefits of no lifetime limit, no annual limit, 
child is up until 26 years old can stay on your benefit. Being a woman, no longer a pre-existing condition. So when he talks about, oh, I'm going to make health care, the, 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 the fact is he did not, he did not inherit a mess. He heard a momentum of growth in our economy. And many more statistics are in the, what I hope you will read, uh, because it was appalling to hear him try to take credit for something that he, uh, and call what the President Obama did a mess that he inherited, when in fact it was a great advantage to the country uh, that President Obama's policies took us uh, to that very positive place of growth and of uh, job creation and deficit reduction. And I talk to my members and they have ideas, I always say, what does your idea do for growth, to, for creation of good paying jobs and reducing the deficit? Let's see how it meets uh, those standards. Uh, what the president has done is not that. And so for him to make it as if he did all this stuff and all the rest, he still hasn't even matched President Obama's growth in the stock market, if you call that uh, a, a real measure of success. And, and in some respects, it's a good indicator. But it's not an indicator of what is happening at the kitchen tables of America's working families, where they're concerned about the fact that many of them have not received a raise in a very long time, uh, that 40 percent of them could not find $500 for an emergency. Uh, the president goes on and saying, oh, we took uh, many more, because of all my growth, many more people are not on food stamps. No, you kicked them off. I know many more people are not taking advantage of this. No, you kicked them off. And that just isn't a fair thing to do in our economy. So it was, a, 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 in my view, a manifesto of, of mistruths, of falsehoods blatantly really dangerous to the well-being of the American people if they believed what he said. So again, we do not want the chamber of the House of Representatives to be used as a backdrop for one of his reality shows with unreality in his presentation. And by the way, a serious breach to start shouting four more years on the floor of the House. Totally inappropriate. We're very excited about how we're going forward to honor our promises to the American people. For the people, we're going to lower the cost of health care by lowering the cost of prescription drugs. And we're on our path with H.R. 3. You saw people holding up the three, H.R. 3. Maybe just three benefits from it people should know. Uh, that it will lower the cost of prescription drugs for them. Uh, it will also increase benefits in Medicare, dental, hearing, and uh, visual a vision in the uh, expansion of Medicare, which is the biggest expansion since its inception, that that benefit will apply to not only Medicare, the, uh, the uh, reduction in cost will not only apply to Medicare, but to all of the uh, insurance plans uh, for, uh, for prescription drugs. We're very excited about HR3. Lower health care costs by lowering the cost of prescription drugs and protecting the pre-existing <laughs> medical condition benefit. Secondly, bigger paychecks, building the infrastructure of America in a green, resilient way. We thought we were in a good place on both of those scores with the president because we had negotiated with the White House on H.R. 3 until the president decided to go with pharma instead of with the American people. Uh, uh, we thought we were in a good path uh, in uh, negotiating with the administration on what the infrastructure bill would contain. Last night he talked about rural broadband. He didn't even know what that was when we were first talking about it. So it's just roads and stuff, you know, roads, bridges, uh, water, broadband, and the rest. And uh, so bigger paychecks by doing he, he talked about some mini plan. He sent over a $200 billion plan, which he then said is a bad plan. It is. It's too small, but too much burden on the localities. So we have really important, and then of course our third agenda, lower health care costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. We think we have a shot with them on the first two, uh, but not on the third, cleaner government. No, that's not something that they, they, he, or the Republicans have as a value. So yesterday the Senate acted, first time in history that uh, a senator has voted against his own president in a, uh, a decision regarding uh, impeachment. God bless him for his courage.
this morning the president said when president people use faith as an excuse to do I don't know if he said bad things, but whatever he said was just so completely inappropriate, especially at a prayer breakfast. So again, we will be expanding our, what we've talked about before, about our infrastructure bill, surface transportation, water systems, uh, broadband, rural broadband, urban desert broadband, are very important to health, education, commerce, and the rest of our country. And then we'll go further with our uh, initiatives on infrastructure for, for school construction and some housing initiatives and initiatives that relate to our, the needs of, of our veterans. We'll be unfolding some of that in the week ahead. Uh, so we continue, continue, continue to do our work. 275 or more bipartisan bills on Mitch McConnell's desk. The Grim Reaper has not taken any of them up. If he had one, I wish he would do, I have my bullet here, I wish he would do background check legislation which would save lives. So it is uh, uh, an interesting time as we go forward. We'll also be taking up in the, in the next week uh, the ERA, the legislation related to the ERA, and there's a great deal of excitement across the country. You see what happened in Virginia, and we're hoping to move the date to include that, uh, that new state in, in that number. Uh, to promote uh, women, especially in this year when we observe the 100th anniversary of women having the right to vote. I know what you're going to say, Chad. What happened to the 49ers? Uh, I'll, I'll ask that at the end. Yeah, but, but, uh, okay, let's, just, uh, let's leave uh, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, uh, her press conference, regular pr uh, press conference, uh, actually sort of, uh, taking apart uh, the State of the Union address by President Trump, a uh, manifesto of mistruths, uh, she said. Uh, let's just discuss the last 48 hours uh, now with a couple of guests in Washington. Uh, Amisha Cross, a Democratic strategist, and Mika Mosbacher, uh, a member of the National Advisory Board of Donald Trump's 2020 campaign. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, on Global. Amisha, if I could just start with you. Uh, Nancy Pelosi there taking apart the State of the Union address, but it's been a pretty disastrous 48 hours for the Democrats, hasn't it? It's been an interesting past 48 hours. Um, we saw a lot of what we assumed that we'd see when it came to the Senate actually finding a way to give Trump an out and um, legitimately discovering a way to create another way to thwart our democracy. Those are things that Democrats expected to happen. I think that what Democrats are focused on right now is obviously making the way and paving the way for the 2020 election. Um, going through this process, you know, we had Democratic senators who were there through the entire impeachment process um, who took time off from actually campaigning campaigning in Iowa because of the importance of this well, process. I'm surprised you and want to bring saw, up Iowa. We, we saw what we assumed would happen. I'm surprised you want to bring up Iowa. I was not the fault of the Democratic Party. The Iowa Democratic Party um, had some mistakes, obviously, and I think that those are things that the Democrats um, are rather upset about. I don't think anybody's excited about that. Um, it gave President Trump another means of sticking, uh, sticking a knife in the back of a lot of the American people and making fun of this process. But it doesn't eradicate the fact that this is a president who used the power of that administration, and the power of his seat, to try to nudge a foreign leader into helping him into the next election. And I think that that is the basis of this entire argument and America can't lose sight of that just because you have a Senate that is led by Republicans who care more about the president and care more about Trump as an individual than they care about putting democracy in the face of this nation as a priority I don't think that that eradicates the fact that this president has abused his power okay uh, Mika uh, what about this sort of competition of petulance between Donald Trump uh, and Nancy Pelosi no handshake ripping up the speech and everything else uh, he's got to be careful hasn't he to be too not to be too triumphalist today he's going to speak in half an hour First of all, that was one of the best State of the Union addresses I've ever seen. I've been involved in politics for 30 years. And he did signal that he was willing to reach across the aisle and work with Democrats on issues that are important to the American people, such as, for example, infrastructure and lowering prescription drug prices. Um, it's but interesting point, during Nancy the press Pelosi's conference. Pelosi's just outlined how that is not true, uh, certainly according can... to the, the evidence uh, provided by the Democrats. Well, first of all, you cannot argue with the fact that we have record unemployment among African Americans and women, and we're at a 50-year low in okay, this country. But the drug prices, Our economy the is drug roaring. Prices? May I just make one point? Yeah. May I make just one point, please? Um, James Carville, who is a Democratic and renowned political strategist, said yesterday that he is concerned. He's scared for his party 
the Democrats are in a disarray. And you know who the victim was during this is Joe Biden, because he's trailing number four in Iowa, the first contest in the Democratic primary. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is in damage control mode. Meanwhile, the president has come out stronger than ever as a result of this impeachment process. The Republican National Committee has raised a record $154 million. We have momentum going into uh, the, the uh, presidential election cycle. And President Trump has had one win after the other. And at the end of the day, what have the Democrats accomplished? OK, Amisha, just looking at the, the recent polls, I mean, he has, it does appear to have had a bounce on this. Wasn't this a political gamble too far by the Democrats? Nancy Pelosi didn't want to start this impeachment trial uh, originally. I, I and and actually, in terms of what public all. opinion is, Congress has been tri tied up with all of this, you know, for, for, for an end result that all, both parties knew would be the case. So there are a lot of falsities stated by um, my friend on the right there. Um, but to answer your question, you think that it has to be taken into context. The Democratic Congress has passed over 400 bills, 400 bills um, lowering the price of prescription drugs, fighting for women when it comes to violence against women, um, fighting to reduce the number of the numbers of gun violence as it relates to school safety, fighting for the things that Americans care about the most. And all of those bills have died once they reach the Republican led Senate. So acting as though or framing something as though the, the Democratic Party has not been moving forward on these bills is a fallacy. Moreover, when we talk about the bills that have been presented before, if the president actually wanted to move forward on reducing prescription okay. drug costs, he could have right. done it. These things have been on his table okay. for a uh, very long we're, we're time. We're running out the of Senate time. Refuses. Mika, does, does Mitt Romney speak for the soul of the Republican Party? Absolutely not. And full disclosure, I was his national finance co-chair in 2011. And I'm extremely disappointed in Mitt Romney. I feel he should suit up and play on the team. He's on the GOP team. Um, there were many independent thinkers in the Senate who listened carefully to testimony and came to the conclusion that President Trump deserved to be exonerated. He's been fully exonerated. An acquittal is an acquittal. I know it's a Democratic talking so, point so, to so keep be, saying that you're guilty. Should he be expelled guilty, now? But he's been Don, acquitted. Should, should he be expelled as Donald Trump Jr. wants? I, I think that it's political suicide that he has committed, and I think he's aware of it because he's out of step with his constituents. OK. All right. Uh, Mika Mosbaka and uh, Amisha Cross, I'm afraid uh, we are out of time. Uh, good to speak to you uh, both. Much more coming up. Of course, we're waiting for uh, Donald Trump to uh, give that televised address in about half an hour's time. Please hope to see you in a few minutes' time. A victory for America. Donald Trump's verdict on being acquitted at his Senate impeachment trial. His first response, obviously, a tweet of a video ending with the message, Trump forever. The legal side is over, but not the politics. What next for the Democrats who tried and failed to bring him down? Well, the president gives a televised statement in just half an hour's time. In this election year, was impeachment a political gamble too far for the Democrats? Acquitted and not letting anyone forget it. Donald Trump is set to give his detailed response to being found not guilty by the Senate in his impeachment trial. On Wednesday, senators voted almost entirely along party lines against charges that he abused his power to benefit his own re-election. Well, a short while ago, while addressing the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, Mr Trump called his enemies dishonest and corrupt. After the vote, US Vice President Mike Pence said he was confident Republicans would win this year. I really do believe that uh, the Democrats keep trying to run down this president because they know they can't run against this president. I think they tried to impeach this president because they know they can't defeat President Donald Trump in November of 2020. Deputy President Mike Pence, well, despite uh, Democratic hopes, only one Republican senator, the former party leader Mitt Romney, crossed the aisle to convict Mr. Trump on the first charge of abuse of power. This is what he had to say. The grave question the Constitution tasks senators to answer 
is whether the president committed an act so extreme and egregious that it rises to the level of a high crime and misdemeanor. Yes, he did. The president asked a foreign government to investigate his political rival. The president withheld vital military funds from that government to press it to do so. The president delayed funds for an American ally at war with Russian invaders. The president's purpose was personal and political. Accordingly, the president is guilty of an appalling abuse of public trust. Mitt Romney, who of course ran for president himself. Well, uh, what do Americans uh, think of all of this? Kyle Kondik is a political ex a polling expert at the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Uh, he joins us now from uh, Washington. Uh, has there been much of a, a pickup, a bounce for Donald Trump? Uh, one thing I think is important to note about the president's approval ratings really fr from now all the way until he took office is that they've really been very steady. Usually his approval is somewhere between 40 to 45 percent. His disapproval is usually in the low, fi low to mid 50s. Uh, and actually over the course of the impeachment saga, which now stretches back several months, uh, I think you could make the argument that the president's approval has actually gone up slightly. Um, but that people's opinions about this really haven't changed. And it's also possible that you sometimes see this in polling that the, the, the party that feels, I guess, more aggrieved at a certain moment, and in this case, I think that's probably the Republicans because they're angry about impeachment. Um, sometimes the polls can maybe reflect their opinions a little bit more than they do of the opposition. What I think will be interesting to track is whether the president's slightly heightened approval rating actually lasts beyond impeachment here, or whether he sort of settles back instead of being in sort of the mid 40s, more toward uh, the low 40s and, and you know, look the stakes here are very high um, the president's approval rating is usually pretty predictive of what kind of share of the vote uh, he may end up getting in the November election obviously he's gonna want that number as close to 50 as possible uh, to, to guarantee re-election yeah I, I just drill down a bit I mean what is the polling like for example in the key swing states compared to uh, other areas Generally, it's pretty similar to the national numbers, although, of course, we have to remember that Donald Trump won the, won the United States presidency despite losing the national popular vote 48% um, to 46% uh, to, to Hillary Clinton. And, you know, part of the reason that Trump won is that he did better than he did nationally in several of the key swing states, states like Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. All those states were uh, very close uh, in, in the last election. And so if you look at some of the polling in, say, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, uh, maybe a little bit better for the president than nationally, although um, the, the differences are usually uh, are pretty subtle. But you probably would expect the president to do a little bit better in those states than he'll do nationally, um, which again means that if, if polls are showing, for instance, that the national popular vote is very close, that might actually suggest that Trump is favored because of his ability to maybe uh, to, to outperform in, uh, in some of these key states that were so vital okay, in 2016. And just briefly, uh, break it down sort of culturally uh, and sexually as well. So in terms of uh, blacks, Hispanics, uh, and the female vote. Uh, generally speaking, uh, non-white voters are much likelier to be Democratic, much likelier to not support the president. Women are much less supportive of the president uh, th than, than men are. That's been true uh, in, in American politics for a long time now, uh, but I think it's become particularly pronounced in, uh, in this era. Okay, uh, Kyle, good to speak to you. Kyle Condick there um, from the Virginia uh, Center for Politics at the University of Virginia. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Donald Trump due to speak. Christina Cook now safely back on Earth. Uh, stay with us here on Global. I just want to take you to the uh, East Room. Here we are. This is the East Room in the White House. It's the largest uh, public room in the White House. But Donald Trump uh, due in about uh, five ten minutes time to give a televised address. We're not quite sure how he's going to do it, uh, whether it's just going to be a statement, uh, following of course his acquittal uh, on the, in the impeachment trial in the Senate, uh, and presumably a few comments about what happened in the Iowa caucuses uh, as well. We will be live for that, so stay with us. Bye-bye. Nancy uh, Pelosi, just to catch up with Gary O'Donoghue before uh, President Trump starts. Uh, what format are we expecting from uh, Trump uh, in a few moments' time, Gary? That's a good question, actually. We're not sure if it's going to be scripted or, or ad-libbed. I imagine there'll be some, some stuff written down. Uh, we're not sure exactly whether he'll take questions afterwards. Uh, 
possibly, possibly not. You can never tell uh, with the president. We're not sure how long it will last. So, <laughs> all in all, I can't really tell you a great deal at this stage, other than that the tone has already been set, hasn't it? Uh, we heard him there talking about this ordeal that he says he and his family have been through. We've heard him talk about or criticise those who he said have used their faith to justify their actions. Big swipe there at the Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, who, if you remember, said she prayed for the President at the beginning of the impeachment process. And, of course, big swipe at Mitt Romney, the Republican Senator, who talked about his faith uh, in the chamber yesterday uh, when deciding to vote uh, to impeach the President on that first article. So uh, he's not in a conciliatory mood by the sound of it. He's not in a mood to immediately move on by the sound of it. He's in a mood to enjoy what he calls this victory over the impeachment hoax and I think probably make sure that uh, the American people hear the message time and time again and they have done in the last 12 hours since this happened but time and time again uh, that he believes this was an attempt to bypass the electoral process, if you like, to prevent him from putting himself before the American people in November's general election. Uh, and I think that will be, Tim, I'm, I'd be amazed if that's not a kind of central th theme of the campaign rallies uh, as we get up towards November, because it does allow the, the, the president to, to sort of reinvent his image as the outsider which is, was enormously powerful in 2016, he can reinvent that with the use of the impeachment process to say, look, you know, the establishment tried to get rid of me, tried to stop me standing again, but we beat them and here I am. The uh, Democrats knew, well, they're pretty sure they weren't ever going to win uh, on, on this impeachment trial, but do they still think it was worth it? Uh, look, I don't think they know the answer to that question yet, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question yet. You're right, they, did, they knew what the, out, the likely outcome uh, would be, given the partisan nature um, of American politics, uh, much more partisan even than it was uh, during Bill Clinton's era, and it had become pretty partisan then. So they knew that it was unlikely, given they had no majority in the Senate, that they would, they would fail there. Their public argument has always been, of course, look, if you've done something impeachable, then you should be impeached. It's, it's irrelevant, in a sense, what the outcome is if the politics uh, prevent it from uh, ending up in a removal from office. They say, you know, you should do it. Now, of course, fine, that's a, that's a high-minded argument, and, and a lot of people will believe that. But the politics of it as well, uh, I think that is something they thought long and hard about. We know that this speaker, Nancy Pelosi, resisted impeachment for a long time. Uh, and was only persuaded when the moderates in her party came round to that idea. So she will have thought long. I mean, she's a, a, one of the best strategists up on Capitol Hill. She's done it for a long, long time. Uh, she will have weighed the risks. And they will be hoping, I think, that the sheer process and the, the, the light which they believe they've been able to shine on the way the president operates and what they say he was prepared to do uh, in terms of his own self-interest uh, will, you know, have some impact on some of those key swing voters, soft Republicans, uh, people who switched over from President Obama to straight through to President Trump, perhaps uh, in those key uh, blue wall states that, that the Democrats that Hillary Clinton failed to win last time, like Michigan and Wisconsin and of course, Pennsylvania, the most important of them. All those sorts of factors, I'm sure, will have weighed in the decision they took uh, to make it. But they don't know yet. They simply don't know. And we won't know, will we, until November the 4th? No. Uh, I think his speech has just been uh, put on the podium. So he might just be a few moments away. Let's just try one more with you, uh, Gary. Uh, how mm. much uh, a problem has been heaped on Mitt Romney uh, by fellow Republicans for that decision to vote on, on that one particular vote? Well, the president and the White House have uh, absolutely laid into him since, uh, since that vote yesterday. Bear in mind, the only U.S. senator, the only U.S. senator ever to vote against his own party in an impeachment uh, procedure. That's quite a, that's quite a, a badge 
uh, to, to be wearing. So the president has laid into him for that, laid into him for, for being a failed presidential candidate, which of course he was in 2012 when he went up against Barack Obama, uh, laid into him for, as we said before, using his faith, according to the president, to justify his actions. You remember seeing those clips of Mitt Romney yesterday in the chamber, seemingly almost in tears, uh, at the, what, during his speech when he was uh, making the case for, for his particular vote on the first article of impeachment. So, yeah, so he is going to have an, not a lot of friends, I would say, on the Republican side of the aisle uh, in uh, Congress right at, at the moment. But he's, you know, he's, uh, he's secure in his, uh, in his state. Uh, he, he comes from Utah. Uh, he's, a, he's a big figure in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. You know, that's his... That's his, uh, that's his neighborhood, right? And he's not up for election this year. He's got another four years uh, after this year before he has to face the electorate. He's pretty safe. So uh, in many ways, uh, some of his critics are also saying this was you know, Mitt Romney looking for his big moment, if you like, uh, testing uh, and checking that this would be OK for him in the long run, that it was much more cynical than a sort of a vote from the heart. It just depends who you believe uh, in terms of his motivation. What we do know, is, of course, is that Mitt Romney and, and uh, Donald Trump have a lot of history. Do you remember during the campaign, Mitt Romney <laughs> reeled off that, um, that sort of alliterative uh, group of adjectives about the president calling him a, a fraud and everything else. And, a, and I, mean, I mean, we went on and on and on. It was an extraordinary clip during the campaign. And, sort of signed him up to the, effectively to the Never Trumper uh, brigade. Uh, and then, of course, having to play footsie in the, in the period of the transition over, you know, potential job in the administration, that very awkward little dinner that they had in New York. Uh, so they have a lot of history uh, behind them, these two. So I'm not surprised that there's, uh, there's, a, there's animosity there, certainly from the president's side. OK, Gary, I mean, we're always used to President Obama being about 10 or 15 minutes late. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Pre President Trump seems to be following in that uh, tradition. A couple of senior military brass have just wa um, walked in. If you're just watching us, actually, uh, it's always nice to chat to Gary, of course, uh, but we are staying on this shot uh, because this is the East Room uh, in the White House where Donald Trump is expected to, uh, well, you know, I'm hoping he is anyway, about to give a televised address. Not quite sure what, uh, how, what format it's going to be, as Gary was just saying, uh, but his response to uh, uh, being acquitted at the impeachment uh, trial in the Senate yesterday. He'll probably be talking about uh, the Iowa caucuses as well. Uh, he's appeared already this morning, actually, a few hours ago at a national prayer breakfast uh, where he talked about uh, corrupt uh, politicians and the fact that uh, people who said that they were praying uh, for the president were, were in fact liars that uh, that wasn't the case at all uh, he's pretty angry about stuff uh, he brandished a copy of USA Today uh, with a big banner headline acquitted so this is his opportunity uh, to speak to the American people and indeed all around the world uh, about uh, what he thinks uh, now the way ahead uh, Gary O'Donoghue I think you're going to have to help me out, Gary, because um, we're now 11 or 12 minutes in. Uh, let's just go back to, because we've been speaking to a couple of pollsters about things as well. Has there been any snap polling uh, following uh, the acquittal and indeed Iowa? Because it, by any, uh, by any means, it hasn't been a fantastic 48 hours for the Democrats, has it? No, and the, the converse of that, of course, it's been a fantastic 48 hours for the Republicans and indeed for the president. Uh, there hasn't anything you want to look at immediately uh, in terms of yesterday. That will have to wait for that, I think, for a few more hours. But we did see at the beginning of the week the Gallup uh, poll on, a, on approval ratings, one of those things that... It's one of those uh, polls that people follow very closely here. It's been going for donkey's years. And the Gallup poll on approval had the president up at his highest level, 49 percent, um, uh, since he became, took office, of course. Now, it's still, you know, still a negative rating because that means, you know, uh, you don't have a majority of people approving of you. But it's high, a lot higher than it has been. It's been bumping around the... 41, 42 mark for most of his presidency. So it's a significant uh, statistical uh, jump. We'll see where that goes. We'll see what the other polling, there will be pollsters out there, I promise you, furiously sampling as we speak. 
uh, right across the whole range of, of issues, the impeachment issue, the, the damage that's been done to the Democrats, the likelihood of, of which candidate on the Democrat side could go up against the president, which we know is a huge uh, factor in the Democratic primary race this time around, a bigger factor than it would normally be uh, in the Democratic primary race this time around. So all that will, will be going on. And it will be interesting to see, uh, you know, what, what kind of pivot the president attempts to do here, because, you know, while, as I said to you before, I think impeachment will be a key part of his, his stump speech, you know, in those campaign rallies, uh, which we'll see through those those swing states, and I'm thinking of places like Florida, where he loves to go, and of course he has his he has his Mar-a-Lago uh, estate there. But he does a lot of campaigning in Florida because it's a huge purple state with a lot of electoral college votes in the presidential election. North Carolina too. I'm sure he'll be going back to the blue wall. We talked about Pennsylvania and, and Michigan, Wisconsin, and places like Arizona, which are now in play. All these areas, he'll be using the impeachment. Uh, trial uh, as a way of saying, you know, you, they tried to remove me and they failed. But what also will be the what also will be the positive pitch? You know, what kind of change will he offer? Uh, will there be anything, any policy elements to it? Um, interestingly, in the State of the Union, Tim, I don't know if you noticed, but there was quite a lot, quite high up in that. I mean, apart from the stagecraft, which. Uh, 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 we saw with the various guests he introduced and the, the medals and, and what have you. There was quite a lot of detail about the economy. Now, a lot of it people have contested in terms of the facts, but there was a lot about unemployment rates and growth and, and, uh, and all those other numbers. Uh, and that's something the president hasn't always bigged up before. The American economy is not, <coughs> excuse me, not in a, a poor state at all at the moment. And it, but it's something that he hasn't always uh, focused on, I think, to the to the uh, unhappiness of some of his advisers. Um, uh, but he may, he may choose to do that because I think one of those things that is still true uh, in campaigning terms is that pocketbook, pocketbook issues, as they call them here, you know, with the money in your back pocket, those do matter to, to voters. They will always matter uh, to voters. Other things matter too, but they are big issues. So I wonder if he'll try and pivot to that as well. And of course, he's got a a couple of trade deals that he can point to. He can point to this new replacement for NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement, this new USMCA, as he likes to call it, the United States Mexico Canada, uh, Mexico -Canada Agreement. He can point to that. He can point to uh, some progress on uh, trade deals with China, for example, a lot of rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Europe in terms of trade. So he's got a few things in the toolbox, if you like. Uh, the question, I think, will be whether or not uh, the Democrats can cut through on some of the detail of that. You know, how many jobs have you brought back to America? Where is this uh, newly invigorated, reborn steel industry you kept telling us about? Are the car companies still leaving or are they really coming back? These are the sorts of things the Democrats will have to focus on. But of course, the president plays by different rules uh, and, uh, and he is a, a master at, at blowing through the detail of those kinds of debates and he does not get bogged down in that detail no, no matter how much people say yes but that's not true yeah uh, Gary Herculean efforts on your part thank you uh, we have been chatting for Pleasure. 17 or 18 minutes now now uh, a brave editorial decision or a foolish one uh, because I think we are, are going to pull away from this just for a couple of moments to move on and uh, guess what it'll probably all start but we're going to go straight back to the East Room in the White House uh, when that begins there we go we've taken the decision Robin uh, Brandt, right, President Trump is due to speak. Let's uh, cross live to the East Room. Here we are. Uh, Stars and Stripes being played. Donald Trump, the doors open for him, and here he comes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Wow. We've all been through a lot together, and uh, we probably deserve that hand for all of us because uh, it's been a very unfair situation. Uh, I invited some of our very good friends, and we have limited room, but everybody wanted to come. We kept it down to a minimum, and believe it or not, this is a minimum. Uh, but a tremendous thing was done over the last number of months, but really, if you go back to it over the last number of years, we had the witch hunt. It started from the day we came down the elevator, myself and our future First Lady, who's with us right now. Thank you, Melania. And it never really stopped. Uh, we've been going through this now for over three years. Uh, it was evil. It was corrupt. It was dirty cops. Uh, it was leakers and liars. And this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. I don't know that other presidents would have been able to take it. Some people said no, they wouldn't have. But I can tell you, at a minimum, uh, you have to focus on this because it can get away very quickly. No matter who you have with you, it can get away very quickly. It was a disgrace. Uh, had I not fired James Comey, who was a disaster, by the way, uh, it's possible I wouldn't even be standing here right now. We caught him in the act. Dirty cops, bad people. If this happened to President Obama, a lot of people would have been in jail for a long time already, many, many years. Uh, I want to start by thanking some of, and I call them friends, because, you know, you develop friendships and relationships when you're in battle and war, much more so than, gee, let's have a normal situation. With all that we've gone through, we've done, I think, more than any president and administration. And really, I say, for the most part, Republican congressmen, congresswomen, and Republican senators. We've done more than any administration in the first few years. You look at all of the things we've done. I watched uh, this morning as they tried to take credit for the stock market from, from, think of that. Let me tell you, if we didn't win, the stock market would have crashed. And the market was going up a lot before the election because it was looking like we had a good chance to win. And then it went up tremendously from the time we won the election till the time we took office, uh, which was November 8th to January 20th. And that's our credit. That's all our credit. And leading up to that point was our credit because there was hope. And one of the reasons the stock market's gone up so much in the last few days is people think we're doing so well. They liked the State of the Union speech. It really is. It's a true honor to give it. Uh, making the State of the Union speech, I was with some people that have been around. They've been all over the world. And one of them said, highly sophisticated person, said, you know, no matter where you go in the world, it doesn't make any difference. There is nothing like what I witnessed tonight. The beauty, the majesty of the chamber, uh, the power of the United States, the power of the people in this room. Uh, really an amazing even I don't think there is anything like that anywhere in the world. You can go to any other country. You can go to any other location, any other place. It's the beauty of everything. It's what it represents and how it represents our country. 
I want to start by introducing some of the people that are here. I know some are going to be left out, but they work so hard. And this is really not a news conference. It's not a speech. It's not anything. It's just we're sort of, uh, it's a celebration because we have something that just worked out. I mean, it worked out. We went through hell unfairly, did nothing wrong, did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. Take that home, honey. Maybe we'll frame it. It's the only good headline I've ever had in the Washington Post. I tell you. But every paper is the same. Does anybody have those papers? Does anybody have them? Because they're really uh, like that, so I appreciate that. Uh, but some of the people here have been incredible warriors. They're warriors. And there's nothing from a legal standpoint. This is a political thing. And every time I'd say, this is unfair, let's go to court, they say, sir, you can't go to court. This is politics. And we were treated unbelievably unfairly. And you have to understand, uh, we first went through Russia, Russia, Russia. It was all bullshit. <laughs> we then went through the Mueller report. And they should have come back one day later. They didn't. They came back two years later. after. Lives were ruined after people went bankrupt, after people lost all their money. People came to Washington to help other people. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I say. They came, one or two or three people in particular, but many people. We had a rough campaign. It was nasty. It was one of the nastiest, they say. They say Andrew Jackson was always the nastiest campaign. Uh, they actually said we topped it. It was a nasty, it was a nasty both in the primaries and in the, in the election. But you see, we thought after the election it would stop, but it didn't stop. It just started. And oh, tremendous corruption. Tremendous corruption. So we had a campaign. Little did we know we were running against some very, very bad and evil people with fake dossiers, with all of these horrible, dirty cops that took these dossiers and did bad things. They knew all about it. The FISA courts should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, it's a very tough thing. And then we ended up winning on Russia, Russia, Russia. It should have taken the one day, as I said, and it took years. Then Bob Mueller testified. That didn't work out so well for the other side. But they should have said that first week, because it came out. Is that right, Jim Jordan? They knew in the first two days, actually. Devin, is that right? Two days, they knew that we were totally innocent. But they kept it going, Mark. They kept it going forever. Because they wanted to inflict political pain on somebody that had just won an election that to a lot of people were surprised. I mean, we had polls that said we were going to win. We had Los Angeles Times and a few, a few papers actually said it was we were going to win, but it was going to be close. And uh, we did win. It was one of the greatest wins of all time. And they said, OK, he won. And you know, I wrote this down because that was where a thing called the insurance policy. To me, when I saw the insurance policy, and that was done long before the election. That was done when they thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And by the way, Hillary Clinton and the DNC paid for millions, millions of dollars, the fake dossier. And now Christopher Steele admits that it's a fake because he got sued by rich people. I should have sued him too, but when you're president, 
people don't like suing. I want to thank my legal team, by the way, not for that advice, but for <laughs> other advice. Pat, Jay, Pat, you guys stand up, please. Great job. Right at the beginning, they said, sir, you have nothing to worry about. All of the facts are on your side. I said, you don't understand. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And that was really true. They made up facts. A corrupt politician named Adam Schiff made up my statement to the Ukrainian president. He brought it out of thin air, just made it up. They say he's a screenwriter, a failed screenwriter. He tried to go to, unfortunately, he went into politics after that. <laughs> Remember, he said the statement, which is a mob statement. Don't call me, I'll call you. I didn't say that. Fortunately, for all of us here today and for our country, we had transcripts. We had transcribers, professional transcribers. Then they said, oh, well, maybe the transcription is, is not correct. But Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and his twin brother, right? We had some people that Really amazing. But we did everything. We said, what's wrong with it? Well, they didn't add this word or that. It didn't matter. I said, add it. They're probably wrong, but add it. So now everyone agrees that they were perfectly accurate. When you read those transcripts, Tim Scott, I don't know if Tim's here, but he said, sir, he's the first one to call me. Sir, I read the transcript. You did nothing wrong. And Mitch, he stayed there right from the beginning. He never changed. And Mitch McConnell, I want to tell you, you did a fantastic job. Somebody said, you know, Mitch is quiet. And I said, he's not quiet. <laughs> he's not quiet. These are the people. He doesn't want people to know him. And they said, is Mitch smart? I said, well, let's put it this way. For many, many years, a lot of very smart, bad in many cases, sometimes good, but people have been trying to take his place. And to the best of my knowledge, I've never even heard the subject come up because they've been wiped out so fast. This guy is great, and I appreciate it, Mitch. And he's also given us 191 now. 191 federal judges, two Supreme Court judges, right? We're up to 191. Yeah. Great guy. Great guy. He's a tough guy to read. I'm good at reading people. Tough guy to read, I'd call him. My wife would say, how'd you do with Mitch? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's what makes him good, when you can read somebody. <laughs> Fantastic job. And he understood right from the This was crooked politics. This was crooked politics. How about all these people? They're running for office. They're saying the worst things about me, like eight senators on the Democrat side. Most of them got wiped out. You know, they got their 1% or less. Most of them got less. They decided to go home. Let's go back to California. Let's go back to wherever they came from. Let's go back to New York. How about that one? Our New York Senator, Gillibrand. Let's go back to New York after they get nothing. And then they take an oath that they will be fair, that they will be reasonable, you know, all of the different things that they had to sign. They're not fair, but here's the beauty. So we have four left. They're saying the most horrendous things about me. It's okay, it's politics. And then they're supposed to vote on me. They're trying to replace me, and then they're supposed to be voting. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's incredible. But, so Mitch, I want to thank you very much, incredible. And you have some of your folks here. And they're incredible people, and they've been right from the beginning. And again, you're out of session, unfortunately. I didn't, you know, I only told these folks, let's do this today. We did a prayer breakfast this morning, 
And I thought that was really good. In fact, that was so good it might wipe this out. But by the end, by the time we finish, this will wipe that one out, those statements. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had Nancy Pelosi sitting four seats away, and I'm saying things that a lot of people wouldn't have said, but I meant every, <laughs> I meant every word of it. But we have uh, some of the folks that are going to be leaving right after this, and they work hard, and they did work hard. Uh, Bill Cassidy, Senator. Stand up, Bill. What a guy. Great man. When I need to know about health insurance and pre-existing conditions and individual mandates, I call Bill or I call Barrasso. We get those two guys, they know more than anybody. Uh, a man who just became a senator, he's a little bit like me. We have a couple of them. Very successful guy in business and he said, what the hell? I'll run for the Senate from Indiana. And he ran, and I saw him on television destroying his opponent in a debate. I said, you know, this guy could win, and I got behind him. And Mike Braun, you have done some great job. Thank you very much. Tough. Tough. Thank you. A man who got James Comey to choke. And he was just talking in his regular voice. He is the roughest man. He's actually an unbelievable, and I appreciate the letter you sent me today. I just got it. But he's got this voice that scares people. <laughs> you know, people from Iowa can be very tough. We're doing very well in Iowa. But I'll tell you, Chuck Grassley, he's looking to call me. Well, you tell me, what did you say? <laughs> now, he wasn't being rough. That was just the way he talked. And that was when Comey, I think that was when Comey announced that he was leaking, lying, and everything else, right? He choked because he never heard anybody talk like that. You know, you should have gone, if, I wish you got angry. You could have gotten the whole ball game. He would have said, I give up. Chuck Grassley is an incredible guy. And a man who, uh, you know, he was running against a tough, smart campaigner. We learned out how good she was, right? She was a great campaigner. In fact, by the end of the campaign, she was actually, I thought she was more for me than you were, Josh. I was worried. I saw her ads. She was saying the greatest things about me. And you know who I'm talking about. And I went to a great place, Missouri, and I said, who do you have to beat her? And they said, well, we have four people. I said, let me see them. I got to interview people. Can you imagine? I'm interviewing people for the United States Senate. This is what I do. Where have I gone? But I love it. I love it because we're getting great people. The first one I met was Josh Hawley. After about 10 minutes, I said to the people, don't show me anybody else. This is the guy. <laughs> He was the attorney general, did a phenomenal job in the state, highly respected. And Claire McCaskill. So the theory was you couldn't beat her. Great campaign. I remember the last campaign she was going to be taken out. She was always going to be taken out, and she wins. And people say, how did that happen? Didn't happen with him. But she got so friendly toward me. In fact, one of the ads I still have, I'm putting it in the archives, is one of the best ads I've ever made. And she tried to convince people that we were best friends. But Josh ended up winning by five or six points. You were unbelievable. You were tough. And you are something. And one of the greatest supporters on the impeachment hoax was Josh Hawley. He was incensed, actually. I watched him. He was incensed at what they were doing and what they were saying. And those were the ones. You know, I had some that said, oh, I wish he didn't make the call. And that's OK. If they need that, it's, it's incorrect. It's totally incorrect. And then you have some that used religion as a crutch. They never used it before. An article written today, never heard him use it before. But today, you know, it's one of those things. But, you know, it's a failed presidential candidate, so things can happen when you fail so badly running for president. But Josh Hawley, I want to thank you. You were right from the beginning. Man, did I make a good choice. Thank you, Jeff. Tremendous future.
A man who is brilliant and who actually was deceived to an extent comes from a great state, Utah, where my poll numbers have gone through the roof. And one of the senators' poll numbers, and not this one, went down big. You saw that? You saw that, Mike? But Mike Lee is a brilliant guy. He's difficult. <laughs> Whenever I sign bills, you know, we do sign a lot of legislation that's it's big and it's powerful, but it's sort of everybody has to approve it. And I see 99 to 1. 99 to 1. I say, don't tell me who's the one. <laughs> Is it Mike? Yes. <laughs> and he always has a good reason for it, too, by the way. But he is. He's incredible. And right at the beginning, he knew we were right, Mike. And I appreciate it very much. You're just fantastic. And say hello to the people of Utah and tell them, I'm sorry about Mitt Romney. I'm sorry. Okay? We can say that Mike Lee is by far the most popular senator from the state. But you've done a fantastic job, Mike, in many ways. In many ways. A young woman who I didn't know at all, but she's been so supportive, and I've had great support from other people in that state, and she's been so supportive, and she's been downright nasty and mean about the unfairness to the president. And Kelly Loeffler, I appreciate very much. Thank you. Great. She saw it very early on. And we have, uh, I don't know if we have other senators here, but we've got a hell of a lot of congressmen. I'll go over them quickly, but they have, they have also been, uh, you know, it helped when we won 197 to nothing. That's got to be a first, Kevin, right? Is that like a first? The Republicans have this image. See, I say Democrats are lousy politicians because they have lousy policy. Open borders, sanctuary cities, they have horrible policy. Who the hell can win? Oh, the new policy is raise taxes. They want to raise taxes. You know, all my life I wasn't in politics, but I'd say, if you're a politician, you want to say, we're going to lower taxes. They want to raise taxes. So they have open borders, sanctuary cities, raise everybody's taxes. Get rid of everybody's health care, 180 million people in the United States, and they're really happy. And we're going to give you a health care that's going to cost more money than the country could make in 30 years if it really does well. That's one year. So I've always said they're lousy politicians, but they do two things. They're vicious and mean. Vicious. These people are vicious. Adam Schiff is a vicious, horrible person. Nancy Pelosi is a horrible person. And she wanted to impeach a long time ago when she said, I pray for the president. I pray for the president. She doesn't pray. She may pray, but she prays for the opposite. <laughs> but I doubt she prays at all. And these are vicious people. But they do two things. They stick together. Historically, I'm not talking now. They stick together like glue. That's how they impeached, because they had whatever the number is, 220 people. So if they don't lose anybody, they'll be able to impeach anybody. You could be George Washington. You could have just won the war. And they say, let's get him out of office. And they stuck together, and they're vicious as hell. And they'll probably come back for more, but maybe not, because the Republican Party's poll numbers, Mitch, have now gone up more than any time, I think, since 2004, 2005. And you know what happened then? But in normal times, decades, you would call it. That was a little unusual time. It was for a very short period. Uh, the Republican Party, Party's poll numbers and Donald Trump's poll numbers are the highest I've ever had them. So maybe they will. It's no way to get your poll numbers up. It's not worth it. Because from my family standpoint, it's been very unfair for my family. It's been very unfair to the country. Think of it. A phone call. A very good phone call. I know bad phone calls. This is a phone call where many people, I think Mike Pompeo was probably on the call. Where's Mike? Mike Pompeo was on the call. Uh, many people were on the call. I know that many people. They even have a print tie. 
bringing up an old favorite word of mine, the apprentice. They have apprentice, they have people on these calls. And I know there are many, when I speak to the head of a nation, and they have many people on. I mean, also, do you think they're just, in the case of Ukraine, he's a new president, he seems like a very nice person, by the way. His whole thing was corruption. He's going to stop corruption. We even have a treaty, 2001, 1999. It's a treaty, signed treaty, that we will work together to root out corruption in Ukraine. I probably have a legal obligation, Mr. Attorney, to report corruption. But they don't think it's corrupt when a son that made no money, that got thrown out of the military, that had no money at all, is working for $3 million up front, 83000 a month, and that's only Ukraine. Then goes to China, picks up $1.5 billion. Then goes to Romania, I hear, and many other countries. They think that's okay. Because if it is, is Ivanka in the audience? Is Ivanka? Boy, my kids could make a fortune. <laughs> they could make a fortune. It's corrupt. But it's not even that. It's just general corruption. And the other thing is mentioned in the call, and something that I've told Mike Pence, our great vice president, I would tell him all the time. And I told him when he went on the trip, because he was over there. He never mentioned anything about this when you had your meeting. It's a terrible thing. But I told Mike, I said, Mike, we're giving them money, and, you know, you're always torn about that, because we have our country to build, we have our cities to build, and our roads to fix. But we're giving them money. Tell me, why isn't Germany paying money? Why isn't France? Why isn't United Kingdom paying money? Why aren't they paying money? Why are we paying the money? Is that a correct statement, Mike? I say, find out what the hell's going on. And I told that to all of my people, OMB, I said, I asked that question. How much is Germany paying? Why isn't Germany paying? Why is the United States always the sucker? Because we're a bunch of suckers. But that's turning around fast. But it makes it harder when stuff like this happens. Because you want to focus. And you want to focus perfectly. Think what we could have done if the same energy was put into infrastructure, prescription, drug prices. Think of what we could have done. And I'm now talking both sides. Think of what we could have done if we had the same genius, because it's genius. I will say, it's genius on the other side. Maybe even more so. Because they took nothing and brought me to a final vote of impeachment. That's a very ugly word to me. It's a very dark word, very ugly. They took nothing. They took a phone call that was a totally appropriate call. I call it a perfect call, because it was. And they brought me to the final stages of impeachment. But now we have that gorgeous word. I never thought a word would sound so good. It's called total acquittal. Total acquittal. So, So I want to, uh, if I could, real fast, just introduce a few of the people. I have to start with, uh, I have to start with Kevin. Man, did you do a job. Lucky you're there. Lucky you're there. Because it wouldn't have worked out. If you don't have the right people, I'll tell you, Kevin McCarthy has done an incredible job. And he loves his job, and he loves his country. Tell you what, Mitch and Kevin, they love what they do. Now, Mitch wouldn't even tell you he liked it. Say, Mitch, do you like it? Mm, I don't know. It's, he's the greatest poker player, right? Kevin will say, I love it, right? And I will say that uh, you're going to be Speaker of the House because of this impeachment hoax. I really believe it. I really believe it. And I'm going to work hard on it. I'm going to try and get out to those Trump, those Trump areas that we won by a lot. And you know, in 18, we didn't win. We just won two seats in North Carolina, two wonderful seats in North Carolina that were not supposed to be won. But I went and I made speeches and we had rallies and we did a great job and we won. We took two seats. Nobody writes about that. If we lost them, it would have been the biggest story of the year. 
But uh, we're going to go. We're going to do a job. And we're going to win a lot of seats. We're going to win a lot of seats. People are very angry that Nancy Pelosi and all of these guys, I mean, Nadler, I know him much of my life. He's fought me in New York for 25 years. I always beat him. And I had to beat him another time. And I'll probably have to beat him again. Because if they find that I happen to walk across the street and maybe go against the light or something, let's impeach him. <laughs> so we'll probably have to do it again because these people have gone stone cold crazy. But I've beaten them all my life. And I'll beat them again if I have to. But what they're doing is very unfair. Very unfair. So Kevin McCarthy has been great. So a few names, right? And there'll be a few you forget. If you want, you can raise and I'll say, great, love to have you, wonderful. But we're going to do the best we can. And I have my cabinet, but my cabinet's different. I appoint them, OK? I didn't see all of them helping so much. You know, they were running their, their various bureaucracies, right? Now, my cabinet's great, and they're all here. But today is the day to celebrate these great warriors, right? These are great warriors. They really fought hard for us. And so I'll start Kelly Armstrong, North Dakota. Kelly, thank you. Great job. Great job. Jim Banks of Indiana. Jim, thank you. Great job. Andy Biggs. Where's Andy? Boy, oh boy, Andy. He got. There's a guy. He's tough. I hear we're doing well in Arizona, huh? It's going good, yeah? I think so. I think I saw a poll that was very good. For me, I think we have to make sure Martha's going to do. I think Martha's going to do good. But we have some states that are going to be uh, not easy. But Arizona's been great. And we're stopping illegal aliens from coming in. We're putting up walls. New Mexico, too, a state that's never been in play for Republicans, is totally in play, right? Nevada's really looking good. We're, we're doing well. We're doing well. We're going to have a great. There's more spirit. I will say this. There's more spirit now for the Republican Party by far than the Democrats. You know, Mike Pence just got back from a place, a beautiful place that Chuck Grassley knows well, Iowa. And he was talking about this fiasco, the Democrats. They can't count some simple votes, and yet they want to take over your health care system. Think of that. No, think of that. But we also had an election out there, and we got 98 percent of the vote. We have two people running, you know, and I guess they consider them non-people. But they are running. I mean, one was a governor. One was a congressman. They're running. We've got 98 percent of the vote. And everybody from the Media was saying, who are those crowds over there? You know, they expect it to be one of these competitive where everybody's running because they want to win, they want to win. And it was Trump, right, Mark Meadows? It was Trump. This was a Trump crowd. And a lot of, actually, a lot of my guys went there. They went to Iowa. And a lot of friends went there. And we had tremendous, uh, they say the spirit. The spirit for the Republican Party right now is stronger, I think, than it's ever been in the history of our country. I think it's stronger than it's ever been. And that includes honest Abe Lincoln. You know, a lot of people forget Abe Lincoln. I wish he were here. I'd give him one hell of an introduction. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was a Republican. <laughs> Abe Lincoln, honest Abe. Bradley Byrne, Alabama. What a great place. Thank you, Bradley. A man who has been a, an unbelievable friend of mine and spokesman and somebody that that I really like. And I know, Kelly, you're going to end up liking him a lot. Something's going to happen that's going to be very good. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. But Doug Collins, where is he? Where is Doug? You have been so great. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Really an amazing job. A young man who is born with a great gene, because I know his father and how great a politician he was, but uh, he's from Florida, sometimes controversial, but actually he's not controversial. He's solid as a rock, and he's a friend of mine, Matt Gates. Matt, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Great job. All right, this guy. So 
He's the NCAA, meaning a couple of years ago when he was in college, wrestling champion. NCAA, that's the big deal. That means in all of college, you're the champ, you're the best. His record was ridiculous. Nobody, would, nobody could beat him. And I see it, you know, every time I see it. When I first got to know him, Jim Jordan, when I first got to know Jim, I said, uh, huh, he never wears a jacket. <laughs> what the hell's going on? He's obviously very proud of his body. <laughs> and they say where he works out, you know, with the congressmen, senators, they work at, they say when Jim works out, even though he's not as young as he was, but they, he works out, the machine starts burning down. You know, it's just a different form of a workout than us, right, Sonny? And there he is, look at that guy. But one day I'm looking, and he looks tough, and I'm looking, and I'm looking at those ears. And I say, those ears have something going on there. I said, did you ever wrestle? Yeah, I did, but he doesn't talk, but I checked. This guy was a world, this guy was a champion, top, top wrestler. And when I had the top, I had all of the teams, and by the way, uh, your Super Bowl champions are coming, I think next week or soon, very soon, and they, every one of them want to be here. And the coach loves us, the coach is great, Andy Reid. And uh, every one of them want to be here. Uh, we have, uh, people love it, but we had all of the NCAA championship teams here. They had the golf, the basketball, the, they had every team here. And one of the teams was wrestling, the wrestling team. Was that Penn State? And Penn State won the title, they have a great team. And I walked up with Jim, and it's like I didn't exist. Those wrestlers, they grabbed him, they loved Jim Jordan, and we love you too, because you are some warrior. Yeah. Yeah. A woman who uh, became a star, we have a couple of women that became stars, you two. And uh, I always liked the name of her, you know, I like the name, Lesko. I liked it. That's how I picked it. I liked the name. I saw that face. I saw that everything. They gave me cards. He had like seven opponents, right? And you have no idea how much the public appreciates how smart, how sharp you are. This I can't tell. I can't tell. They just said, you know, she's really good. She's really talented. And I said, let's go. We worked with her. She won her race. Tough race. It's no longer tough because what she does out there is, is incredible. Arizona loves her, but you were so incredible representing, I don't say me, representing our country and getting it out of this impeachment hoax. What you did was incredible. So Debbie, please stand up. Debbie, let's go. A man who I, I became very friendly with, I don't know why. Do you ever have where, I'll ask the media, Certain people call, you take their calls. Other people call, if they don't have information, they won't take anybody's call. But other people call, and you don't. This is a guy, he just, he's just a very special guy. His wife, I actually like better than him, to be honest. Because he doesn't know that I know that he didn't actually support me right from the beginning, but she did. And on my worst day, right? On my worst day, my worst. I won't tell you why it was my worst, but it was not one of those good days. She got on a bus, got many other buses, and women all over North Carolina, and they toured North Carolina. Well, Mark was back sort of semi-supporting another candidate, which he ended up leaving very quickly. I don't think you had a choice because of your wife. But thank her, and Mark Meadows, he's an extraordinary guy. I mean, the only problem is, I guess he's announcing, he'd only win by 40 points but he's announcing that he'll be uh, not running this time. Do you have somebody good to run? Somebody gonna win your district by at least 20 points, please, okay? But he's a tremendously talented man, not just as a politician, as a human being, he's incredible. And, and during these horrible times, I mean, the way he worked, and Jim and all of you guys, the way they worked was so, it was like their life was at stake. So many, Ron DeSantis is another one. He worked so hard. Then he called me, he said, sir, I'd like to run for governor. He said, governor? 
I don't want you to run. I like you staying. You know, I want to run for governor. And I said, well, if you have to, I'd like your support. I said, how can I support you? You're at three. He was at three. He had no money. Somebody else was at 38, and they had 22 million cash, right? I said, look, if it's important, I'll do it, because he's, he's been another great warrior. And he's, by the way, he ran. I endorsed him. His numbers went through the roof. The man who we beat, who was expected to win easily, called me after the race. He said, you endorsed him, and it was like a nuclear bomb went off. There was nothing I could do. He never even spent his money. He saved it. But Ron DeSantis is another one. And now he's the governor of Florida. And by the way, he's a great governor. He's a very popular governor. His numbers are in the 70s. And he's done a great job. But Mark, I want to thank you very much. Fantastic job. Thank you very much. Mark Meadows. And Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Where's Mike? Central Casting, what a job. You can represent me anytime. You can represent me anytime. Thank you. What a job you've done. Thank you, Mike. And a man nobody's ever heard of except the other side. He's the other side's worst nightmare. This guy goes down into dungeons and basements. He'll find a document no matter what. He's the most legitimate human being. He's the hardest worker. He's unbelievable. He took tremendous abuse. I mean, abuse. The, the, the media and, you know, the other side and the bad ones, the leakers, the liars, the dirty cops, they wanted to destroy him. They tried. They got close, but he wouldn't let it happen. And honestly, in a certain way, he was the first one. Wouldn't you say Jim and Mark and everything? This was the first guy. He came out of nowhere. He's saying, these people are corrupt. He's still saying it. And he was unbelievable. Devin Nunes. He was unbelievable. So true, Devin. He'd come in and say, I didn't even know him. I just heard there were like, there was this congressman who kept going into a basement, into files. He knew something was wrong. You felt it, right? And now we know a lot more than we knew then, right? You never thought it was as bad as it is. And hopefully we're going to take care of things because we can never, ever allow this to happen again. Scott Perry of Pennsylvania. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Really great. And you're doing very well over there, by the way. Just so you know, A man who is a, a, I mean, central casting. If I'm going to pick Perry Mason, I'm going to do a remake of Perry Mason. Other than Bill Barr, I pick this guy. But I have to say, I pick Barr. I pick Barr first, right? John Ratliff, right? But I have to tell you, if we're doing a remake of Perry Mason, the man I get. There's nobody in Hollywood like this. John Ratliff. <laughs> right? Stand up, John. So, such a great lawyer. Incredible guy, incredible talent, but just a great lawyer, and we appreciate it. He gets on that screen, and everyone says, I agree. The other side folds up so fast. We'll probably be using a lot of you in the next year. But you have been fantastic, John. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. A man who's braver than me and braver than all of us in this room, he got, he got whacked. He got whacked. My Steve, right? I went to the hospital with our great first lady that night. Right, honey? And we saw a man that was not going to make it. He was not going to make it. He was the doctor. And I told him, his wife, I said, she loves you. Why do you say that? Because she was devastated. A lot of wives wouldn't give a damn. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of wives, a lot of wives would have said, hey, yeah. I said, how's he doing? Oh, she couldn't even talk. She was inconsolable. Most wives would say, not good. Uh, listen, I'm going home now. <laughs> but the doctor came in. The wife is like, she was a total mess. She was really devastated. And it really looked like he had a 20, 25 percent chance. I think you said a record for blood loss. And Steve Scalise, 
I actually, honestly, I think you're better looking now. You're more handsome now. You, you weren't that good looking. You look good now. He looks better now. Can you believe it? I don't know what the hell that is. Sure. Better now. What a guy. And he was practicing. He was practicing for the baseball game against, I guess, the Democrats, right? And this whack job started shooting. Hurt Rogers. I don't know if Rogers is here. But hurt a number of people. Hit him. But really hit Steve. He, Steve was at second base. He was the second baseman. And he went down, and, and it was terrible. I mean, I saw the whole thing, and it was terrible. Unfortunately, you had two brave policemen with you because of your high position in Congress. You had two policemen, and they were amazing. The man and the woman. And they came, and they didn't have rifles. They were against a supposedly pretty good sharpshooter with rifles, good equipment. And all they had was a gun. And they started coming in from the outfield shooting. And they're so far away that a handgun is not uh, preferred. And this guy has the rifle and he's hitting people. And he was going to move up and there was no out. I mean, if he would have been able to move up, there was no way to get out. The entrance was a single entrance way on the other side where he was. So everyone went into the dugout, ran into the dugout. But Steve was really hit badly in the stomach. And uh, with a bullet that rips you apart, it was supposed to do that. It rips, it rips you apart. And these two people came charging forward, boom, boom, boom. And one of them, you know who? One of them, him, got the shooter, hit him, and then got him, killed him from long distance. It was amazing. If you didn't have those two people, you can imagine, right? You, you can imagine what would happen. So uh, Melania and I went to the hospital that night, and he was in such bad shape, and he's been working ever since so hard. But six months ago, they had a baseball game at the National Spark, and I'm watching. And it's, it's on television. And it's just, you know, game people, you want to win it, right? And Steve's at second base. The poor guy can't even walk. Do you remember Bobby Richardson for the New York Yankees? He was known for range, Louie. Range. He had the greatest range. If a ball's hit the shortstop, Bobby Richardson's the second play, second baseman. Bobby Richardson would field the ball. If it's hit the first base, he'll throw it to the first baseman. He had unbelievable range. This was not Steve Scully's. <laughs> St Steve had no range. One foot, and he has to fall down, right? Because, you know, he was trying to get better. I don't know who the hell put you on the field. And this is a true story. So the game starts. And the first pitch, Steve's in at second base, and the guy is really in bad shape. And I said, this is terrible. A shot, ground ball shot, is hit to second. And Steve, I say, I didn't have time to think too much, but I said, this is not good. That ball is going toward him. And this guy stopped that ball, caught the ball. He's now laying down. He throws the ball to first base, he gets about. I said, it's the most incredible thing. I've never seen athletic. I've never seen anything like it. Right? And he gets him out, and they then took him out of the game, which was a very wise thing, because you could never do that again in a million years. But you weren't going to let that ball go through. I don't care if it was hit by the greatest of all time, right? That ball was not going through you because you are a warrior. Steve, he is fantastic. You are fantastic. You and Liz and Kevin, what a great, what a group. I mean, what a group. I got lucky. I got lucky because you need the right people. If I had the wrong people there, it'd be, uh, maybe a different story. Maybe we'd be celebrating something else. But I really want to thank you, Steve Scalise. And Elise, you. I just read this story, it's just, uh, most incredible, what's going on with you, Elise. So I even said, you know, I was up campaigning for helping her, but I thought, she looks good, she looks like good talent. 
But did I not realize when she opens that mouth, you were killing them, Elise. <laughs> you were killing them. <laughs> Elise, and there's a big story in the New York Post. I love the New York Post because they treat me well. There aren't too many of you that do, but today you're treating me well. I even had a great headline. I, New York Times, Washington Post. I had all these great headlines. Maybe we should just end it right there. But you had the greatest story yesterday in the Post, that people from all over the country are contributing to her campaign. They were so enthralled with the way you handled yourself, what you said, the way you said it. And uh, I'll always be your friend. I think it, it was, it's really an amazing story. What a great future you have. What a great future. Thank you. First Lady agrees, by the way. First Lady agrees. And Michael Turner, you can represent me anytime. Where's Michael? Where is he? Well, you can represent me. How good were you? There's another, there's another Perry Mason type, I think, right? What do you think, John? But Michael, you were fantastic, and we appreciate it. Brad Winstrup. Where's Brad? Brad. Great. Great. Uh, it's a big day for lawyers. You notice only the lawyers stayed. They, all the lawyers stayed behind. Lee Zeldin, how good are you? How good are you? Man. And Lou, your name's not down. They didn't give me a name. Do you know if, if I didn't announce Louie, whoever the hell made this list, I, I got to get rid of because I, if I wouldn't have announced Louie, it might have been the end of the presidency. <laughs> Louie, you have been so great, so tough, and so smart. I got it. I got it. But Louie has been amazing. He's a tough guy. He's a smart guy. He's streetwise like crazy. We love Texas. And we're with you all the way, Louie. We're with you all the way. Thank you very much. So, so that's the story. We have a great group of warriors, and there are others left, and I guess probably, I'm sure I didn't mention a few, and I apologize if that's the case. Uh, how's CPAC doing? Good? Huh? My man, stand up, please, will you? He's the one he said, you should run. <laughs> right? Matt said, it's like five years ago, six years ago, and I made a speech, and then they do some kind of a straw poll. Who made the best speech? And he said, I made the best speech. Oh, with all these professional, I hate to say this, with all these professional politicians, they voted by far the best speech was Trump. He calls me, he says, you should run for politics. I say, what do I know about politics? But you know what? We learned quickly, and our country has never done better than it's doing right now. So it's pretty good. <laughs> But thank you, Matt. Great. Say hello. So, so that's the story. We've been treated very unfairly. Fortunately, we have great men and women that came to our defense. If we didn't, this would have been a horrific incident for our country. When you have Lisa and Peter, the lovers, the FBI lovers, I want to believe the path you threw out for Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. That's the office. There's no way he gets elected, meaning me. There's no way he gets elected. This is Peter to Lisa. He's probably trying to impress her for obvious reasons. <laughs> There's no way he gets elected. But I'm afraid we can't take the risk. Now think of this. In other words, if I get elected, they can't, they, two lowlifes, they can't take their risk. They can't take their risk. Think of it. And that's where it came up, the greatest word of all, insurance policy. So he says, but I'm afraid we can't take the risk. She may lose. It's like an insurance policy. In the unlikely event, you die before you're 40. In other words, if I won, they were going to do exactly what they did to us. They were going to try and overthrow the government of the United States, a duly elected president. And if I didn't fire James Comey, we would have never found this stuff. Because when I fired that sleazebag, 
all hell broke out. They were ratting on each other. They were running for the hills. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. It's in the hands of some very talented people. We're going to have to see what happens. But I can tell you, in my opinion, these are the crookedest, most dishonest, dirtiest people I've ever seen. They said, this is struck. God, Hillary should win 100 million to one. This is about me. This is an agent from the FBI. Look how they let her off. 33,000 emails deleted. Nothing happens to her. Nothing happens. It's unbelievable. But think of that, God, Hillary should win. One. These guys are investigating Hillary. Then they go to work for Mueller, the two of them. And when Mueller found out that everybody knew that they were 100% this way, he let them go. But they deleted all of their emails and text messages. So when we got the phone, they were all deleted. Could you imagine the treasure trove? They illegally deleted. So they left, they left Bob Mueller. He had the look, but he didn't have a lot of other things. Always had the look, Mr. G-Man. And I love the FBI, and the FBI loves me, 99%. It was the top scum, and the FBI people don't like the top scum. So think of that, 100 million to one, and he's investigating me. And then, God, Trump is a loathsome human being, isn't he? These are the people looking at me. I'm really not a bad person. And Paige said, yes, he's awful. How would you like to have that? This is just, this is the good stuff. This stuff, a hundred times worse than that. These are all dirty people. And now, I just heard that they're suing the United States of America because they were interfered with. Uh, not gonna let it happen. Just not gonna let it happen. We cannot let this happen to our country. Thank you. So, I'm going to leave now, and I don't know if any of you have anything to say. You could say it, but this is sort of a day of celebration because we went through hell. And I'm sure that Pelosi and Crying Chuck, I've known this guy all the time. The only time I ever saw him cry was when it was appropriate. Known him for a long time, Crying Chuck. But I'm sure they'll try and cook up other things. They'll go through the state of New York. They'll go through other places. They'll do whatever they can, because instead of wanting to heal our country and fix our country, all they want to do, in my opinion, it's almost like they want to destroy our country. We can't let it happen. Uh, Jim Jordan, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Huh? Mark? No, I, just, I want to just say that uh, this reflection today it is a small reflection of the kind of support you have all across the country. We've got your back. This was a, a highly partisan situation. Pelosi said, I, I copied it down exactly. Before the impeachment, she wanted to impeach from day one, by the way. Don't let it fool you. You know, she said, no, the impeachment is a very serious thing. I said, she wants to impeach. Watch. Impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and so overwhelming and bipartisan, Bipartisan. It was 197 to nothing. And other than one failed presidential candidate, and I call that half a vote because he actually voted for us on the other one. But we had one failed presidential candidate. That's the only half a vote we lost. So we had almost 53 to nothing. We had 197 to nothing. And the only one that voted against was a guy that can't stand the fact that he ran one of the worst campaigns in the history of the presidency. But she said, there's something so compelling, has to be so compelling and so overwhelming and bipartisan. I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country. She was right about that. 
And it's just not worth it. That was Nancy Pelosi a year ago, right? And I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame. But as I said, if we can put this genius to work on roads and highways and bridges and all of the things we can do, prescription drugs. You know, we had Secretary Azar is here, and I want to thank him for this, but we had uh, first time in 51 years where drug prices actually came down last year. First time in 51 years. But what we can do working with both parties in Congress is, would be unbelievable. It would be unbelievable what we can do. And I know Chuck Grassley is working very hard on it, and Mitch is working very hard on it. But what we can do is, is incredible. What we can do just generally. We've done so much without it. We've rebuilt our military. We've cut regulations at a level that nobody thought possible. We'll always protect our Second Amendment. We all know that. But I just want to tell you that it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, I want to apologize to my family for having them have to go through a phony, rotten deal by some very evil and sick people. And Ivanka's here, and my, my sons, and my whole family. And that includes Barron. That includes Barron, who's up there as a young boy. Stand up, honey. Ivanka, thank you, honey. Come. So I just want to thank my family for sticking through it. This was not part of the deal. I was going to run for president, and if I won, I was going to do a great job. I didn't know that I was going to run, and then when I got in, I was going to have to run again and again and again. Every week, I had to run again. That wasn't the deal, but they stuck with me. And I'm so glad I did it, because we are making progress and doing things for our great people that everybody said couldn't be done. Our country is thriving. Our country is just respected again. And it's an honor to be with the people in this room. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, a victory lap for President Trump. Uh, strongly critical of uh, his democratic opposition and the whole impeachment to trial. Some very strong language used at them uh, about the corruption, uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, there was evil uh, with dirty cops uh, and corruption uh, and the people who had forced him and his family through this. So Donald Trump uh, speaking for, well, just over an hour there to an audience uh, who were hanging on every word. He named uh, individuals from the legal team and indeed individual uh, senators uh, and thanked them uh, for uh, what they had done uh, to bring about this acquittal in the Senate, which in fact uh, even the Democrats realised uh, was probably going to be the likely outcome. Our correspondent, uh, Gary O'Donoghue has been uh, listening to that uh, I'm sure victory lap I think is probably the best way of putting it but some pretty tough expressions for uh, his enemies uh, including James Comey uh, and others from a couple of years ago yeah I mean with with apologies to your listeners uh, but the president said it described the former FBI director as a scumbag uh, quite simply he talked about the top echelons of, of the FBI as scum this is the FBI the president's very own FBI, top echelons as scum. Uh, very strong language. Talking about the impeachment itself, he said it was evil, it was corrupt, it was dirty cops, it was leakers and liars. He said this should have never happened to a president. I don't know whether any other president could have taken it, he said. He described the whole event as a celebration and not a press conference. He name-checked, I mean, dozens and dozens of people in the room. He went off on sort of wild, rambling escapades into professional wrestling, into baseball, into all kinds of other sports. 
He singled out Steve Scalise again, didn't he? The Republican congressman, the man who was shot uh, by a gunman at a baseball game, a congressional baseball game, singled him out and said, you're better looking than you were beforehand. Uh, he went right round the room congratulating everyone, made his 13-year-old son, son stand up there at the end and take the applause of the room, relived the Russia inquiry, said that was bullshit. He said the Russia inquiry was bullshit. And uh, an indication, I think, of the kind of the impact it's had on him, I mean, in, in some ways, he relived every single moment of his presidency, didn't he? Right from the moment of the escalator coming down in Trump Tower, announcing his candidacy, right up till now. And my goodness, does he have a list of grievances. Yeah. Uh, and where does it go from here? <laughs> I don't know. I mean... You wonder whether that's cathartic or not. I don't know. Uh, he did something similar-ish. I mean, this was 62 minutes on our reckon reckoning. Uh, he did something dissimilar after the, the Mueller report was uh, released, if you remember. Uh, the Russian hoax, as he calls it. Uh, and it's, it's hard to know whether that's the president getting this off his chest, whether it's a, a kind of an attempt to communicate to the American people. I mean, there will be, you know, plenty of clips played from it, but uh, at times it lacked a certain coherence and a, a certain sharpness. Uh, one wonders whether there wouldn't have been more impact in, in something very honed, even if it contained the same kind of vitriol. But 62 minutes of this, I, I think, I mean, I don't think there's any other word for it than rambling. It was rambling. There was a lot of rambling throughout this whole process. Uh, a good deal of, of, of self-justification, as you'd expect. The man's been acquitted on impeachment charges. You've got to, you've got to uh, remember that fact. But also a good deal of self-pity as well. Uh, and I think um, you know, there will be people out there who don't expect that from a, a US president. Well, no, but that could be said about many aspects of uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, tenure in office uh, and, and looking ahead uh, for another four years as well. Uh, again, one other person to be singled out for uh, harsh criticism, uh, real anger, Mitt Romney, that failed presidential candidate. Yeah, I mean, he's had another swipe at Mitt Romney. Earlier on today, he had a swipe at him talking about people who used their faith to justify their actions. Uh, he, as you say, called him a failed presidential candidate, uh, unpopular, everything. I mean, uh, he is trying to isolate Mitt Romney as best uh, he can. So, uh, it, but it shows you that, that that single vote out of, you know, when you look at 100 senators voting twice on two articles, there was only one vote out of line in terms of the, the partisan nature of it, and that was the, the Mitt Romney vote on the first article and that clearly got under the skin of the White House and the president. As we were listening, uh, Gary, you know, as you say, just over an hour, uh, a lot of the international uh, networks running it, but, but uh, coast to coast in, in the States as well? Uh, to be honest, Tim, I don't know the answer to that. I imagine so. Uh, I, wasn't, I was watching your output rather than anyone else's, but I imagine so, to be honest. I mean, certainly the cable networks and of course it will dominate the the evening new the main evening news bulletins around people's tea time uh, later on today uh, i mean which bit you pick is is a, is going to be a tricky bit for those those news directors to decide of course but uh, i mean i think now we'll, we will perhaps see the translation of some of this stuff into the campaign rallies as we talked about earlier uh, this does give him fresh things to say on the campaign trail uh, and he will see this is a, a pretty good week for him so far a, a vindication and exoneration as the White House called it yesterday okay uh, Gary O'Donoghue uh, in Washington uh, having uh, explained what we thought he was going to say uh, for 15 18 minutes uh, uh, and then uh, staying with us uh, for that full 62 minutes of President uh, Trump's uh, victory lap as I've uh, described it really uh, after being acquitted uh, by the Senate in those impeachment uh, hearings that is it for this edition of Global uh, Today plenty more on the website from me and the team hope to see you soon
You're watching Beyond 100 Days Victory Lap. Donald Trump celebrates his acquittal in the impeachment trial. Unleashed, unbowed, unashamed, the president rides a wave of good news. In a long speech, Mr. Trump delighted in the moment, thanking his supporters, slamming his opponents. But now we have that gorgeous word. I never thought a word would sound so good. It's called total acquittal. Hello, I'm Katty Kay in Washington. James Reynolds is in London for us. Donald Trump has a lot to celebrate today. He's been acquitted in the Senate. His approval ratings are up and the Democrats are, let's face it, in a bit of a mess. And boy, did he celebrate. At a long White House speech this morning, the president reveled in his successes and wallowed in his grievances. It was, of course, classic Trump, a stream of consciousness campaign style event and his supporters in the room loved it. He thanked his lawyers, his family and the politicians who stood by him during the trial. He showed the front page of the Washington Post. He could have selected from a lot of the national papers. And Mr. Trump spoke uninterrupted for over an hour. Here's a little bit of a flavor of it. It was evil. It was corrupt. It was dirty cops. Uh, it was leakers and liars. And this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. It did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. Yeah. First went through Russia, Russia, Russia. It was all <laughs> Why is the United States always the sucker? Because we're a bunch of suckers. The Democrats, they can't count some simple votes, and yet they want to take over your health care system. Think of that. And I love the FBI, and the FBI loves me, 99%. It was the top scum. And the FBI people don't like the top scum. So that was President Trump thanking his allies, dismissing his enemies, declaring that his behavior was perfect. But we should compare his comments to President Clinton's public remarks shortly after he was acquitted by the Senate back in February of 1999. I want to say again to the American people, how profoundly sorry I am for what I said and did to trigger these events. Well, joining us now is White House mm. reporter at Politico, Gabby Orr. Uh, Gabby, the Oscars, of course, are just in a few days, but I wonder if President Trump didn't try and steal a march, uh, stepping up to receive the Best Acquitted President Award. Uh, how did you see his speech? Well, the, the remarks that the president delivered from the East Room today uh, certainly cemented the fact that he is willing to take as much of a victory lap as possible after his acquittal in the U.S. Senate. He will continue to campaign on his acquittal. Uh, I've spoken with a number of advisors on his campaign who say that this is really something that they're going to use to build momentum as he focuses on his reelection uh, efforts in the months ahead. They think that it energizes the Republican Party. It's one of the reasons why the president sort of ticked through all of his Republican supporters during his remarks in the East Room today, uh, singling out different members of the Senate, Josh Hawley, Mike Lee, talking about the House members who were so critical during the impeachment proceedings on the House side, uh, Elise Stefanik, uh, Steve Scalise. And so there were a number of, of moments where he sort of previewed what we can expect to hear at his campaign rallies in regards to how impeachment has turned out for this president. Gabby, you heard Bill Clinton there sounding contrite after he was acquitted in his impeachment trial. Of course, the only other president in modern times to go through an impeachment. Is that contrition just a sign of a different president or is it a sign of a different time in American politics? I think most people watching today's remarks from President Trump would say that that is a characteristic of just a different president, that this this is somebody who loves to revel in the feeling uh, of, of being defended by the Republican Party, of driving Republican unity, and it's 
certainly likely to frustrate a lot of Republicans who talked about voting to acquit him, but also believing that this entire impeachment process might cause him to change in some way, that he might behave more presidential, that he might think before uh, doing things like what he said during his phone call with the Ukrainian president mm. that caused this in the first place. Susan Collins being one of them, she was, of course, a critical vote in the Senate in terms of acquitting this president. And when she ultimately issued a statement saying that she would vote to acquit him, she also acknowledged that she's hoping for some type of behavioral change. And that was certainly not on display uh, during the president's speech today. And, and in terms of his supporters listening to this, watching his acquittal, this is a, a good moment for Trump supporters, isn't it, Gabby? A lot is going in the president's direction. This is specifically tailored to his core base of supporters. The, the, the strategy surrounding impeachment all along for the president and for his campaign has been to use it to energize the Republican base. And we've seen that happen behind the scenes. Uh, there are internal polling numbers that the RNC has touted that show that Republicans are more firmly behind President Trump than at any point before in his presidency. And most of that is because of impeachment. They're frustrated by it. They feel like uh, Democrats Democrats have sort of wasted the time and money of American taxpayers throughout this process. It's a talking point that he is he has mentioned at his campaign rallies. It's something that we've heard from a number of White House officials and administration officials, and it's going to be something that we hear uh, in the months ahead as the president hits the campaign trail mm. and starts to build a message about his reelection that involves impeachment. Okay, Gabby, you're there at Politico for us. Gabby, thank you very much. Um, for joining us, let's look at the legal side of this. Joining us now is Kim Whaley. She's author of How to Read the Constitution and Why. She's also a law professor at American University. Kim, thank you for joining us. Is this all over now? Is the whole issue of investigations, impeachment, the possibility of any fresh impeachment charges all done for this president? For this term, I would say with respect to impeachment, it's all done. I don't think there would be any political energy around a second process, even if the facts were to come out that would arguably prompt a second process. And we will continue to hear facts leak. We still haven't heard from John Bolton, for example, although there are, as we know, multiple other investigations of this president, of his campaign going on both at this federal and state level. At the federal level with Bill Barr, uh, the attorney general of the United States, and clearly a, a, a very staunch Trump loyalist, I, I highly doubt we will see any investigations at the federal level produce anything that is negative for this particular president while he's in office. Uh, hey, Kim, James here. Uh, in 1974, the mere threat of impeachment and a trial forced uh, Richard Nixon to resign. But in the last two decades, impeachment and a trial has just sort of bounced off both Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. Has impeachment then lost its sting as mm -hmm. a punishment? Yeah, I, I do think impeachment has lost its sting as a punishment from a legal standpoint. And the question for Americans going forward, particularly for November 2020, is what's left of a method of the various methods of accountability for the office of the presidency. Uh, as uh, Gabby just indicated and Caddy was discussing, this this per man is not going to feel at all chastened in his behavior going forward. And as the office, the powers of the presidency expand with this man, they, that mantle of power will be handed off to the next president and the next president, regardless of political party. Impeachment isn't going to function as a, a serious threat going forward. Uh, we, this president violated the appropriations clause, other aspects of checks uh, that, that really aren't functioning anymore. So, 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 Kim, if, if impeachment doesn't function as a check, what will in the future? Well, Is that's it just elections? A, yeah, that's what I wonder. I think we really probably are down to uh, 2020. I mean, the way it works, you could have, uh, you know, appropriations. Congress can manage the presidency by basically not giving the money for him to do what he wants to do. But he, but he bypassed that with the border wall. He bypassed that, obviously, with Ukraine. Congress could pass legislation limiting the president's power. He ignores it. Um, they, they can limit his ability to appoint officials by not, con not basically withholding Senate consent. Uh, but Rudy Giuliani didn't even go through that mm. process. So, so he's, in lots of ways, he's just bypassing the structural checks on the presidency. And I think loyalists say, he's our guy, it doesn't bother us. But in the long run, it does have an impact, I think, on, on the structure of democracy in the United States.
So interesting. Kim, thank you very much um, for joining us. It'll be fascinating to see what happens to, uh, you know, to the whole process as you're suggesting there uh, now, especially with a president who is this unapologetic about what has just happened to him. Katia, uh, it's fascinating because, of course, here in the UK, you must have covered court cases in your early uh, times as a reporter. You know, when the defendants vindicated or acquitted, they sort of meekly step out on the outside the courtroom, stand rather quietly, and their solicitor reads a statement and they sort of nod and meekly walk off. I've seen in America sometimes people bouncing down the courtroom steps. I guess Mr. Trump is more of a bouncing down the courtroom steps in vindication, punching the air kind of person. Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting, that press conference, listening to it, and it, it was long, you know, over an hour, and he spoke nonstop without interruption. And it was part sort of um, vindication and triumphant, but there was also this sense that he has that he's been wronged um, constantly, and, and that is something that Donald Trump had before he came to the presidency. He had it up in New York as a businessman that he used to say he wasn't really accepted by the elites up in New York. And I think you, it's that combination of triumph and grievance that is quintessentially Trump and drives his supporters because it's he echoes what a lot of people in America feel if they feel that they've been left behind right into the re-election campaign this is beyond 100 days I'm Katie Kay in Washington James Reynolds is in London our top stories it started with a whistleblower and ended with an easy acquittal. President Trump's impeachment trial may be over, but its explosive after effects continue. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. The death toll from the coronavirus in mainland China rises to more than 560, with more than 28,000 confirmed infections inside the country. And coming up in the next half hour, the Battle of the Bees, Buttigieg and Bernie tussle for first place in the Iowa caucus. Yes, the results still coming in just days before voters head to the polls in New Hampshire. And we'll look at the female astronaut who has just returned to Earth after a record-breaking stay on the International Space Station. In case you were in space and you hadn't yet heard, the Senate has given its verdict, an acquittal for Donald Trump on both articles in his impeachment trial. It's no surprise, of course, and the result almost everyone predicted. The Senate voted along party lines, with the exception of the Republican Mitt Romney, who voted guilty on abuse of power. Now, what's next for the Democrats? They can continue down a path of investigations and attempted subpoenas or stop where they are and try to sway voters to their own policies, health care or wealth inequality, for example. These are the issues, of course, that helped them to regain the House of Representatives back in the 2018 midterm elections. We're joined now by Democratic strategist Capri Cafaro, who previously served as a Democratic member of the Ohio Senate. Uh, Capri, thank you so much uh, for joining the program. We started Absolutely. this program with President Trump's victory lap and you kind of have to weigh it mm. against the position that the Democrats are in at the moment with what sure. was pretty much a fiasco in the Iowa caucuses and yes. a real tussle about who they can nominate who can take on Donald Trump in November. Well, look, there's no question that there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and instability inside the Democratic Party, uh, you know, whether it is, you know, looking at the visual examples uh, coming out of the State of the Union with uh, Speaker Pelosi ripping up President Trump's speech to, you know, basically failing to remove President Trump and the impeachment process that's gone on for a very long time. And then, of course, these internal machinations um, coming out of Iowa, where the Iowa Democratic Party um, had been basically facilitated these Iowa caucuses and we've had a you know a lot of questions coming out of you know, that process um, and now the Democratic National Committee chair Tom Perez is now calling for a full re canvassing of those results so the chaos continues but certainly both Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders seem to be the beneficiary of all of the Ohio uh, excuse mm. me Iowa chaos so as of as of now so Capri, on this issue of who the Democrats can nominate to take on Donald Trump, do you think the conventional wisdom that Bernie Sanders has a lot of energy but is perhaps too left wing for the center of America to be actually elected president still stands? And would you like there to be a more moderate person who is an alternative who seems viable? Because Joe Biden doesn't look very viable right now. 
That's right. I think, Caddy, you bring up a very good point. The big loser in the, the last few days here is Joe Biden, uh, by all accounts, coming in fourth out of the Iowa caucuses, regardless of kind of what the re-canvassing will be. He's trailing as well uh, in the polls that we're seeing in New Hampshire. Mayor Pete Buttigieg has got a shot in the arm, uh, and his polls are increasing, probably coming in second now in New Hampshire. I, I do think that conventional wisdom still stands and that Bernie Sanders is too far to the left uh, for the general electorate uh, in, in this country. We are still, I think, a center-right country, not a center-left or far-left country. And in those states, like my own state of Ohio, like Michigan, like Wisconsin, mm -hmm. those states and Pennsylvania that, that um, Donald Trump won in 2016, some by very narrow margins, those mm -hmm. places are looking for a more common-sense, moderate candidate to challenge Donald Trump. Uh, Capri, there's only one thing I really want to know. Uh, does New Hampshire have a fail-safe vote counting system? <laughs> it's a totally, it's a very good question, but if, you know, it's a totally different system because it's actually what I would call a real election administered by boards of elections uh, and the secretary of state, the, you know, sort of the, the actual governmental oversight in New Hampshire, rather than being executed and administered by a state party. I think by all accounts, this has mm. proven that state, that, that parties should not be administering elections the government it should be left to the government but that's a debate about whether caucuses should, should remain or we should go to the primary co primary process which is what we see in new hampshire two totally different situations okay capri kafara thank you capri for joining us um again thank you Senator Mitt Romney is facing a big Republican backlash over his decision to vote against Donald Trump in his impeachment trial. The president tweeted a video suggesting that Mr. Romney was a Democratic spy and apologized personally to the people of Utah for their senator. For the Utah senator, the president's attempts to get the Ukrainian president to interfere in the upcoming presidential election clearly rose to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors as outlined in the Constitution. And here's a quote from the senator himself. I've gone through a process of very thorough analysis and searching. I've prayed through this process. The president did, in fact, pressure a foreign government to corrupt our election process. Mitt Romney gave that comment in an interview with McKay Coppins of The Atlantic. Uh, he joins us now. The reporter, thank you so much for joining us. Why did Mitt Romney do what he did and vote to convict the president yesterday? You know, I, I think that we have become here in Washington, especially so conditioned uh, these last few years to try to look for kind of what the cynical political angle is behind every decision a lawmaker makes. But when I sat with him the day before he made that uh, that announcement and he told me what he planned to do in an interview, it struck me that he, he really was personally scandalized by uh, what the president had done. He told me that uh, trying to uh, trying to corrupt the election uh, in the U.S. by involving a foreign country is what autocrats do. And uh, he, he said that he, he felt duty-bound by his conscience and by his oath to God that he took to, uh, to vote this way, even though he knew there would be immense political blowback. Mr. Trump is not particularly popular amongst Mormons. Um, and, of course, Mitt Romney is a Mormon. To what extent did that weigh into his decision, do you think? I think it was it was certainly part of it you know it, it, he comes from the state of utah which is a very conservative politically state traditionally but the this state because of the the mormon population has been very ambivalent about president trump he won this state in 2016 but with a plurality of the vote uh voters really are are, are not sure whether what they think about president trump and and i think that mitt romney has been liberated in a way that a lot of his fellow republicans aren't by the fact that his constituents by and large, even if they support some of the politi policies the president has pursued, they, they fundamentally think he's not a man of great character. And uh, that, that freed him up to kind of follow his conscience in a way that other Republican senators haven't. Uh, he lost, of course, the 2012 presidential election, but he's now become the first senator ever to vote to remove a president from his own party. Will he be remembered for this uh, in history as opposed to that mm -hmm. presidential election? Hmm. 
You know, it, it's hard to know how history will remember him, but I think it will. You know, one of the things that that struck me about Romney as I've I've spent time with him these last few months is that he is in the twilight of his career. He's in his 70s. Uh, he has had a long career in business, a long political career, and he is thinking about his legacy now. And he is especially thinking about the lessons that he took from his father, who was also a Republican who kind of uh, stood apart from his party in the 60s on matters of civil rights. And I think he. He wanted to follow that example, and I think he's thinking that uh, you know he says he'll be a footnote in history. He doesn't think that he's going to be this great historic figure, but he does think that history will vindicate the decision that he made. Okay, McKay Corbins, thank you so much for joining us um, with that interview with Mitt Romney, who has had a lot of backlash, as we said. People are shouting the word traitor at him, uh, letting him know in the streets that they don't approve of what he's doing. It is not an easy position, and he knew it that he has put himself into. Uh, China is halving tariffs on $75 billion worth of U.S. imports next week in a sign that the trade war between the world's two richest economies is easing. The actions are part of China's commitments under the first phase of the deal that it signed with America last Last month. Tariffs will be cut for 1,700 products mirroring American commitments under the deal. Chinese import tariffs on US cars, pork and fish will fall from 10% to 5% and levies on soybeans and crude oil will be cut by 2.5%. Let's speak now to trade policy expert Matty Dupler. What does this do for American workers who are producing the goods that tariffs are now being reduced on, Matty? Well, this is the first step that China has made to implementing that phase one agreement. Now, when China cuts tariffs, the United States is expected to cut some of its tariffs as well as an effort of goodwill with that agreement moving forward. But the United States will maintain a, uh, some tariffs on a vast majority of imports from China, still about $370 billion worth of imports from China. Uh, President Trump, of course, is very fond of saying that tariffs are paid by foreign countries. That is not the case. I'd like to remind viewers that tariffs are taxes paid at the border. So that means that tariffs are paid by consumers and businesses at the importing country. Now, it is interesting the timing of this announcement from China. Uh, observers didn't know when exactly both China and the United States would start implementing portions of this phase one agreement. And uh, we know that everything China does now is against the backdrop of the coronavirus. So there is some speculation that China may be moving forward with the phase one agreement in an effort to create some economic churn when they're otherwise seeing a lot of stress on their economy because, of course, manufacturing has to slow down to try and combat that virus. So I do think that the development now with China announcing that this, this tariff cut will happen next week is somewhat interesting and it may be an attempt for China to combat some of the slowdown it may experience because of the industrial stop in production. Is there room in the world for two global economic superpowers or by definition is there always going to be friction between the US and China? Hmm. I, I think by definition, there will be friction between the U.S. and China, but on the net, that helps consumers in both countries. I mean, listen, the reason that we have this entire trade war with China is because the president has said that he wants to reduce the trade deficit with the world's second largest economy. Now, the trade deficit is a product of American consumers who have benefited from the low cost of goods uh, and the low barriers to transporting those goods across the world economy. So the United States and China, consumers in both countries, have certainly benefited benefited from this competition. Now, the question is, how do those two countries continue to relate to one another uh, when that friction is, uh, is, is uh, put on the, uh, the global stage um, by, by the world leaders? You know, the, Ch uh, the Chinese government has been very clear that they want to overtake the United States as the world's number one superpower, but they have a lot of challenges mm -hmm. in doing so. It's a centrally planned economy with a huge population that they need to feed and provide energy uh, uh, support for, and they simply don't have the means to do that. Now, the United States, uh, of course, as the world's preeminent uh, economic power, has the upper hand here. But as we've seen, when these two countries get in conflict one with one another, there's downward pressure on each. The question mm. will be which country can survive those kinds of tensions. And so far, I think the United States has proven it is able to do so in a way where American consumers and businesses uh, still feel like they're receiving the upper hand. Okay, Matty, uh, great context. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And this impeachment trial may be relevant, too, to Republican senators who are facing a battle for re-election. For instance, Martha McSally in Arizona, Cory Gardner in Colorado, Susan Collins in Maine. They're all in tight races. They all voted to acquit. 
Here's their leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell. I can tell you as a poll watcher who's looking at polls and certain Senate races, every one of our people in tough races, every one of them, is in better shape today than they were before the impeachment trial started. The thing is, the Democrats also see the acquittal as a political opportunity. Have a listen to Mitch McConnell's Democratic counterpart, Chuck Schumer. Every Republican knows that this president is vindictive, vengeful, vicious sometimes, and they don't want to oppose him. There are a whole lot of Republicans, I believe, who knew we were right, but said, I don't want the bother of being attacked relentlessly by the president and the hard right. Well, Chuck Schumer may be right about those Republican senators. We can't know at this stage. But what we do know is that Mitt Romney was the only Republican senator to vote to convict the president, and inevitably the attacks have followed. Donald Trump tweeted a little earlier saying the failed presidential candidate Mitt Romney devoted, if he devoted the same energy and anger to defeating a faltering Barack Obama as he sanctimoniously does to me, he could have won the election and, well, Mitt Romney would have known that was coming. Interestingly, perhaps the most endangered senator up for re-election is the Democrat Doug Jones. He represents Alabama, a state that Donald Trump won handsomely in 2016. And he released a statement before he voted to convict the president saying, look, I didn't want to be in this situation, but in the end, I will defend the Constitution. Let's bring Gary back in again. And uh, Gary, I, it's difficult watching from afar. You can help me out here. But what's interesting is how hard it is to read what impact this whole impeachment process may have on both sides. I think that's right, and I think that's why you're hearing them trying to shape the narratives pretty quickly here. But what is certainly true is that you got effectively on the Republican side. You didn't get a split, did you? So Cory Gardner and Martha McSally and Susan Collins all decided to back their president. So there's a certain consistency in the, at least their view of how this thing is likely to play out. Now, those three places are very different. Colorado is very, very purple at the moment. Cory Gardner is in trouble there. Martha McSally in Arizona. Arizona has only really just become competitive in the last few years. And don't forget, she's not won an election there. She was appointed to that post after the death of John McCain by the governor. Mm. And she's only been there for, for a year or just a little bit more. So she's very vulnerable too. Susan Collins always vulnerable in Maine because Maine, you know, has its own voting habits and very independent minded. And, and Susan Collins has always been have, had to be mind, mindful of the kind of traditions up there. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of different factors in different places mm. uh, and something that uh, will be exercising campaign strategists for the next months to come. Well, I've got you, Gary. Just a quick question on Ohio. This farcical scene that's been playing out for the last few days with the Democrats not being able to release complete results from the caucuses there. But where have we got to with that? You've got your Ohio's and your Iowa's mixed oh, up there. But yes, I take your point. <laughs> um, yeah, Iowa. I mean, what a mess. Uh, they're doing a re-canvassing, which effectively means just sort of combing through the figures they have. Um, as things stand, there's a, a, a smidgen of a difference between... Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders in terms of the lead. Uh, frankly, the show has moved on. Uh, Buttigieg was very clever in claiming victory very early. That has driven the narrative. Bernie Sanders has retaliated by saying, hey, I just raised $25 million in January alone. Beat that. But now they're on to New Hampshire. Uh, and I think uh, Pete Buttigieg will take a really big bounce into that. And, mm -hmm. and you'll see a proper head-to-head -head there between Bernie Sanders and Buttigieg with Elizabeth Warren slightly gasping for air, I think. Gary, thank you. Keep me on the straight and narrow, as always. And if you want more background on uh, the US presidential election, of course, you can get that through bbc.com slash news. From German politics back to American politics, because our lead story is that after being acquitted in his impeachment trial yesterday, Donald Trump has today taken direct aim at the Democrats. It was evil. It was corrupt. It was dirty cops. Uh, it was leakers and liars, and this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. I don't know that other presidents would have been able to take it. Some people said no, they wouldn't have. And really, the point of the impeachment process now is not about will Mr. Trump be removed from office or not. To be honest, that was always very, very unlikely. This was always a political gamble by the Democrats. And now both the Republicans and the Democrats are working to spin the outcome of that impeachment trial to serve their purposes. We know Mr. Trump's overall ratings are better than they were a couple of months ago. But the broader impact on the presidential election, 
of course, we'll have to wait and see. I'll see you in half an hour.